interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Law. Welcome back, everybody. Your host, Michael, here at Reason and Theology on a Wednesday evening, doing a part two of our review of Dr. Taylor Marshall's book, Infiltration. I'm going to be joined in here just a moment by River Run and Kevin Simons, just as last time. I'm uh, going to continue, but this time we're going to be diving further into the text of the book itself. Last time we were setting the stage with a lot of pre preliminary information and didn't get the opportunity to dive in to the text itself as much as we wanted. So we decided to do a part two so that we can get to the nitty gritty. So that's what we're going to do. Bringing on River Run and Kevin coming up next. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. How are y'all? Pretty good. Good. Yourself? Yeah, doing good. Good to have y'all back on. Looking forward to this. Um, you know, before I, I actually want to go over a couple of things that I noticed, but before we do that, River and Kevin, I think y'all were going to lead us in a prayer. So if y'all are ready for that, y'all can go ahead and uh, take it away. In omni patris et fili et spiritus sancti. Amen. Amen. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, Pater noster, qui es in celis, sanctificento nomen tuum, ad ignat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis udie, et emite nobis debita nostra, Sicud et nos temidibus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem. Sed libera nos amalo. Domine exario rationem mea. Et clamo meus ante venia. Oremos. O oh Lord, we beseech thee that the Comforter, which proceeded from thee, may enlighten our minds and lead us into all truth, even as thy Son hath promised unto us. Per Dominum nostrum Jesum Christum filium tuum, qui tecum vivet et regnat in unitari spiritus sancti Deus, per omnia saecula saeculorum. Amen. Sancta Maria, sede sapiense. Ora pro nobis. All right. Thank you all for that. I appreciate it. Uh, I think it's always good to start in prayer. So thank you all. Um, now, what I wanted to do is just briefly go over something that I noticed today going over infiltration. And then I'm going to kind of let you all take it away. Um, I was doing just some brief reading here of, of just opened up to a random chapter. I say opened up. I have the electronic edition. So uh, I guess I opened the file to a random uh, part, which was chapter 19 called the Inf Theological Infiltration of Vatican II. So I don't have page numbers because, again, I have the electronic version, but it is going to be um, in this chapter. 
that we're, we're going to briefly look at. I noticed something here. He takes up the issue of subsists in that Vatican II uses, and he criticizes it by saying this, quote, Rahner was charged with reframing the doctrine of the church for modern times, and the result was the Rahnerian document Lumen Gentium. Rahner introduced a new ecclesiology in which the Church of Christ is not the Catholic Church, but rather subsists in the Catholic Church. This seems to contradict the teaching of Pope Pius XII in his 1943 encyclical Mystici Corporis, that the mystical body of Christ and the Catholic Church are one and the same entity. Now, there's a lot of problems with this. This is just a complete misunderstanding when it comes to doctrine and the concept of subsists in. Now, I'm sure there's a whole lot of people out there who could take the term and completely abuse it, but there was no funny business going on here. There was no doctrinal change. There's no denial of anything Pius XII taught. In fact, as Dr. William Marshner notes, uh, the term subsists in is maybe even a little bit more stronger language than the term that Pius XII uses. You just need to probably understand what subsist in means. And we could sit here and do a whole hour-long video talking about that. Instead of doing that, we'll push pause on that. In fact, I'll probably do a whole show on it. But uh, for now, I would refer individuals to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. It has a whole document on this. It's called Responses to Some Questions Regarding Certain Aspects of the Doctrine of the Church. And here it takes up the issue of what does subsist in mean in the Second Vatican Council? Why does it use this term? Well, here's what it says, quote, in number eight of the dogmatic constitution Lumen Gentium, subsistence means this perjuring historical continuity and the permanence of all the elements instituted by Christ in the Catholic Church in which the Church of Christ is concretely found on this earth, end of quote. It's reiterating the idea that everything, the fullness of ecclesiology, the fullness of the faith is there in the Catholic Church and in the Catholic Church only. Why, however, use the term subsist? It has some advantages because we can talk about the analogy of using substance, right? But we can also talk about accidental features now when we use this term. And we can say that some of those who are separated from communion with the Catholic Church have some accidental features of the church, but only the Catholic Church has all of those things substantially. This is why we can say that there is only one church, and it is the Catholic Church. We can affirm everything Pius XII says, and yet... We can also affirm everything that Augustine and many other theologians and saints since the time of Augustine have developed. What am I talking about? Starting with Augustine, just going to briefly go over this, not going to go into a whole lot of detail. Y'all can go and watch my lecture, which I linked in the description, where I talk about the history of outside the church. There is no salvation. And I discuss a lot of these developments. So what what's actually going on here is an implicit denial of quite a few things that were taught in the preconciliar church when somebody rejects the concept subsist. And they're, they're, they're um, in a way per, perhaps unconscious to them. They're denying certain doctrines in the preconciliar conciliar church when they do that. But starting with Augustine, you can see him talking about how, look, if there is a person who is in an area and they don't have the opportunity to go to a Catholic church and all they have are schismatic Donatist churches in their area, that person, as long as they don't intend schism in their heart, can go to the Donatist church, receive their sacraments, and then receive grace from those sacraments. That's coming straight from Augustine. In his work against the Donatists on baptism, uh, chapter uh, two, I believe. In fact, I have the uh, quote in front of me, but I'm not going to sit here to read the whole thing because it will take a while. I'll just say that um, I'll, I'll end up doing the show later on with the quote. So I'll, I'll reference you all to a future show. But for now, you can go and read that chapter and you will see him talking about there being elements of grace that belongs to the church outside of the formal boundaries of the Catholic Church. He's saying that right there, St. Augustine, in his works, dealing with the Donatists. And that's effectively what is being implicitly affirmed when we use subsist in language. We're saying in the Catholic Church, in the Catholic Church only, 
It has the fullness of the faith. It has everything that is given to us by Christ. It's the one true church. But we also recognize there are some accidental features, if you will, of that church that are outside of its formal boundaries. And it's not as if they exist apart from the church. Wherever they are, in some loose sense, there's a connection with the church. There's also a disconnect with the church, which means that those people are in serious danger and need to be reconciled with the Catholic Church. But we can recognize that there could be grace given outside of the formal boundaries of the Catholic Church. This is why we don't rebaptize people whenever they are baptized outside of formal membership in the Catholic Church. We, we understand that there could be validity to their sacrament and even perhaps grace given if they didn't intend schism or heresy or anything like that. It's coming straight from St. Augustine. And then that's especially developed with the discovery of the new world, with the Salamancan school, with quite a few Dominican theologians and priests and Jesuits, quite a few um, even saints begin to develop this, Bellarmine being one of them, begin to develop these concepts and they culminate in Vatican II. So what Vatican II is doing when it uses this term subsist end, though that language is, is somewhat new, the concept of what is being communicated is not new. And that has plenty of continuity with church history. And to then deny the use of the term subsist in is to then implicitly deny quite a few developments that have been taking place from the time of St. Augustine up until the Second Vatican Council, especially culminating in Pope Pius IX. In other words, Somebody is engaging in novelty whenever they try to deny the concept of subsist in and accuse it of being novel, ironically. So I, I just found that troubling that uh, we, we have that whole criticism of Vatican II being rehashed here. I felt that it wasn't, it wasn't necessary and it also wasn't properly taking into account the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, what it has said, the proper explanations of what it is, and also... It doesn't seem to be very well informed of the uh, uh, of church history and a lot of developments that have been taking place on this matter for quite a long time. More importantly, I came across this section. This was right after this same chapter, chapter 19. Continuing with Rahner, he says, quote, Rahner was a student of poisonous philosophy of Heidegger, and he saw only the existential present moment as counting. He reinterpreted all Christian doctrines in this light. Here we go. Rahner said that Jesus died in history, but his resurrection did not occur in historical time. And he gives a uh, reference here, reference 89 which we'll read here in just a second. But I, I thought, that's odd. I, I've never come across Rahner saying that the resurrection didn't happen in time. Let me go and look it up. So reference 89 says, um, here it is. Foundations of the Catholic Church, an introduction to the idea of Christianity, translate, uh, translated by William uh, D-Y-C-H, however you pronounce that. New York, Seabury Bur Press, 1978. Pages 264 to 277. 1978 is the uh, year that we're looking at. So you know what I said? I actually have that edition. Let me go grab that off the shelf and read these pages, 264 to 277, which I thought was a really odd. Why give a 13 different pages here? If you've read the primary source and you know where Rahner denies the resurrection uh, in time, the temporal aspect, you would be able to give me one page number and an actual quote. But he doesn't do that. He gives this large section. Well, page 264 to 277 of the 1978 edition doesn't make sense because that section doesn't end with two, page 274. The section ends with page 285. So it was very odd to see him quoting, well, why end with 264 to 277. Why in with 277? I thought, that's odd, but let me just move past that. Okay, maybe th there's just something that I'm missing here. That's possible. Well, I read the section, and I don't see him denying the temporal aspect of the resurrection ever in here. What I did find is on page 266, it seems that he, in fact, affirms the temporal aspect to the resurrection. In fact, I'll grab 
uh, here in a moment, I'll grab the book and read y'all the quote. It seems that he actually affirms the temporal aspect. And then on page 274, he goes on to show the difficulties involved with people who want to deny traditional aspects of the resurrection. This does not sound like a guy who's trying to deny the resurrection in its temporal aspect. It doesn't make sense. So not only am I not seeing what Taylor Marshall is saying, I'm also finding things that seem to lend to a contrary opinion or the con a contrary interpretation. Well, I thought, you know, okay, well, no, no big deal. Maybe he just misunderstood something. You know, maybe there was just something in there. He misread it. He, he, he didn't read the context. It happens. Okay, well, I move on. And then he says this quote right around the same area. Uh, Taylor Marshall says this, uh, chapter 19, quote, we are saved because this man, speaking of Jesus, who is one of us has been saved by God and God has thereby made his salvific will present to the world historically, really, and irrevocably. And here Taylor Marshall is concerned because he's saying Taylor Marshall actually says that Christ is the one who needed salvation. And then he goes to quote this. And I look up his source and the source says, I bid 284. So that tells me, okay, what's well, the 1978 edition of the same book, page 284. I go to page 284. That quote is nowhere there. It's not there. It's not in that edition. He must be referring to a different edition, which tells me Dr. Marshall didn't actually look at the book itself. The very reference that he's giving, he didn't look at it. It sure seems like he got this quote from someone else and is using a secondary source and their quotation of the primary source without actually verifying the quote. Well, that's the impression that I got. So you know what? I did a quick Google search. Where would he have got this from? Well, uh, here's what I did find. Let me share my screen here. Uh, Y'all should be able to see that. The website is people.bu.edu forward slash WW uh, Wildman forward slash BCE forward slash Rawner dot HTM. Okay. I found this. He quotes the exact quote that Taylor Marshall uses. Well, I should say Taylor Marshall quotes the exact same quote that we find here in this online source. It starts exactly where Taylor Marshall starts it. It ends exactly where it Taylor, Taylor Marshall ends his quote exactly where this source ends. And guess what it cites? Rahner, page 284. So I found, okay, well, here's another source saying it's page 284, but he doesn't tell me his edition. So that tells me this guy here is probably quoting the previous edition. It seems like Marshall, perhaps, I don't know this for a fact, but it sure seems like Marshall saw this, thought it was the 78 edition, and simply quotes that. The other evidence to support that is I kept wondering, where is he getting this idea that somehow... Rahner denied the temporal aspect of Jesus, uh, Jesus' resurrection. Well, you'll note something in the immediate context here. This is the quote that he quotes uh, in chapter 19. But you'll notice a few sentences before this author says, but the resurrection for Rahner is not a historical event in time and place like the death of Jesus. It sure seems to me like what Dr. Marshall did is he, it seems like he read this section. He sees what this author says about, well, Runner's denying the temporal aspect of the resurrection. Dr. Marshall presents that in his book as his own interpretation of the primary text. He doesn't give any kind of reference or source for that. Uh, not anything that's accurate, I should say. And then immediately after that, we find a quote from Dr. Marshall that matches this exact quote in this same exact source and gives us the miscitation, page 284, the very miscitation that Dr. Marshall gave. In other words, it seems to me like Dr. Marshall might be reading secondary sources, taking their ideas, their interpretations of Rahner, appropriating it as his own, not quoting the secondary source for the idea, and then using their quotes of 
their edition, which differs from his edition of Rahner, and presenting it as if he has gone and verified those quotes, quoting a primary source and not quoting a secondary source. He didn't quote the website. He quoted the primary source. And when you go and look it up, it's a miscitation that matches this very miscitation. Um, so again, I'm not accusing him. Perhaps he has some kind of explanation that would make sense of this, but I don't see a way around it. It sure seems like this is what happened, that he's using ideas that belong to others and not properly citing them as their ideas, and that he is using their quotes of documents and then presenting them as if he verified those quotes, and then they're not even accurate citations because the other people that he's quoting are using a different edition than the one Dr. Marshall is using. So it goes to show that he's not even looking at the primary text. He's not even looking at Rahner. And this isn't here to defend Rahner. I criticize Rahner. There's some things about Rahner I don't like. There, there's some very uh, serious concerns I have of Rahner when it comes to outside the church. There is no salvation in his understanding of it. And I've been very clear about that on the show. And I've criticized Rahner on that. But so don't take this as me trying to defend Rahner. What this is doing is I'm trying to note that it seems to me like Dr. Marshall isn't going to the primary sources. He's using secondary sources and he's presenting it as he's used as if he's going to these sources. And then he seems to be using other people's ideas as his own. That to me is very concerning. And I understand that this is not uncommon when it comes to infiltration. Perhaps you gentlemen can speak a little bit about that. Kevin, uh, beginning with you and then River, uh, your, your comments. Okay. So we were going to briefly, just very briefly recap what we did last time. So uh, last time we spent a lot of time, as he said, on preambulatory material. Uh, we particularly talked about the idea of conspiracy. We talked about reification, uh, which is where um, you confuse an abstract idea with a thing that's going on. I talked about how when they, both in their defensive material and even internally, there's a sort of Mott and Bailey fallacy going on, wherein you start with this hard argument about how there's a physical plot going on, and then you retreat into a more ideological uh, and philosophical space where you say, oh, I'm just describing how things sort of look in terms of what they are like. Um, and then sort of ultimately we want to know what kind of story this is. Is it a story about Freemasonry, um, a historical plot laid by Freemasonry, or is it about something called the Freemasonic, which is an ideology or philosophy or, or a way to do things. And indeed, I, I'm going to assert that I've sort of found in his writing a tendency to slide between Freemasonry, the plot, and then Freemasonry understood as the spread of naturalism. Um, one of those would require sort of on the ground evidence and the other would not necessarily would require on the ground evidence, but is going to end up being philosophy and not history. Um, but you know, th that's just the nuts and bolts of what we worked on last time. I want Kevin to go ahead and start talking about Marshall on Fatima because Fatima uh, has a, is a big and By player. the way, did, did y'all have any comments ab about that part before we move on to Fatima? Because, I, and, and I do want to emphasize again, I'm not accusing uh, Dr. Marshall of actually doing this. I'm just saying it looks that way. And I would like to hear Dr. Marshall's explanation on the miscitations and his, uh, his, his reasons for saying what he said. I, I would just like to hear an explanation that doesn't lead me to this conclusion. So again, I'm not uh, accusing, but I am concerned and asking questions and I would like to hear a response from Dr. Marshall, hopefully you know, in a, in a show that he does. Uh, but Kevin, did you have any comments on, on this part before we move on to Fatima? Yes, actually, it kind of ties in. I, will, I was hoping to talk a bit about Bella Dodd, but just so everybody can follow along, if they have a copy of the of Marshall's book, Infiltration, the section, uh, the pages that you were talking about, at least in this first edition, first print, is pages 138 to 139. Okay. Uh, that's where they will find um, those particular chat uh, sections. So it's the bottom of 138, top of 139. 
Thank you. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, though, um, even there's a larger story with Bella Dodd, which I'll get to here soon. Um, but there's something that in the Bella Dodd literature that Marshall does, in fact, talk about in chapter nine. It's entitled Communist Infiltration of the Priesthood, page uh, 83 of the first edition uh, of the book. Uh, Marshall begins talking about the famous Catholic, uh, well, the famous communist lawyer who reverted to the Catholicism of her youth, Balladon. More on her a little bit later, but she testified, or she went, she made a private comment to Dietrich and Alice von Hildebrand in the 1960s about how she knew of four cardinals that were working for communism at the Vatican. Well, this is uh, this was revealed in 2001 by Alice von Hildebrand. Uh, the comment, and on pages 88 through 89, Marshall gives a list of potential candidates for who uh, are these, these four cardinals. Um, I don't, let's see, 26 possible people, the ones he lists, and uh, I'll, even, I'll put the thing up here on the, so people can see the list here a little bit. Um, unfortunately, this is another area where we have some issues with Marshall's citations, because uh, it looks as though the way he introduces this, he says, quote, we can restruct, can construct, excuse me, a limited pool of cardinals by noting that Dodd was active since the 1930s and that she converted in 1952. Moreover, these cardinals were active as late as 1966 or 1967. These historical restrictions yield only 26 possible cardinals who could be the four communist cardinals claimed by Dodd. Then he proceeds to give the list. Unfortunately, there is no citation. And the only way that you could really get this list is by looking at various documents from the Vatican that are published, such as the, the Annuario Pontificio, which lists all the Vatican dicasteries, who's there, who's who. Um, there's no citation to this. But um, I don't know. Can we share my sc a screen here for a second? I, I pull it up here for you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Okay, uh, let's see, share screen, here we go. Okay, is it showing up? Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a website here, uh, importuni import, uh, opportuni importuni, blogspot.com, and it's, it's in the blog entry titled December 4th, 2016. It's here right by Cesare Baronio. Bella Dodd's Four Cardinals, Here are the Names. Uh, it's an Italian website, so I think it, they do things in English. Um, and they were going off of an article from 1 Peter 5, which is run by Steve Skojak, who was here last week, actually, in the chat room. Uh, recently published an article about Alice von Hildebrand, translated into Italian by Una Vox, One Voice. And then um, they give the list. But here's the thing. To discover the names of the four cardinals mentioned by Bella Dodd, we need to do a simple calculation. Then they give the premises. And then this person who runs this website says, I have relied on the list of the cardinals created during the pontificate of Pius XII available on the internet. We know that uh, to the death of Pius XII, the sacred college of 53 members, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, Cesare Baronio gives the list. When you go down this list, to Agagianian, Basella, Micara, Miguigan, uh, uh, Camelo de Vasconcelos Morta, Gilroy Spellman Camara, uh, Danielle Frings Ruffini. These, this, these names in this order appear in Marshall's book exactly in the same order. I don't think there's one out of order, um, if I remember correct, if I'm looking at everything correctly. So this was one person who actually did the work, this per as far as I know, this person says, I have relied. So this person is claiming that they did the work. But now the same list is be found in Marshall's book, and there's no citation, and it looks like Marshall went through and did the same thing. Like he he went to the Annuario Pontificio or this website this, that Cesario, uh, Cesario Baronio mentions, this list of cardinals created during the Pontificate of Pius XII. So this is not an, what what you notice there, Mr. Lofton, is not exactly an isolated incident, and it raises it does it's more evidence, and I suppose more could be said, but 
But I think uh, that's the general point uh, here is that you can find the same list, same name, same order on Opportune Importune, the blog of Cesare Baronio. So uh, it leads to the same questions that you're asking. Where is Marshall getting his sources from and why is he not telling people where he got it from? And and keep in mind, you know, you yeah. have to uh, reference those things, it, you know, unless it's common knowledge, you know, when Abraham Lincoln was born, you don't have to reference that. But something like that, you need to reference it unless you've done the work yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I just I think people need, need to be aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I issue a challenge even to Dr. Marshall to explain himself. He really has to explain himself because he's before the bar of the world here in history and he, he needs to explain himself because this is not a light matter, you know. Um, I, frankly, I would like an a, a explanation as well um, be, yeah. because I'm, I'm seeing this repeatedly. So, Yeah, because quite frankly, he's making a lot of money and uh, even pe other people have noticed that. Uh, there was a priest earlier this year or late last year who actually did some of the math based upon Dr. Marshall's Patreon account, I think it was. And uh, Marshall's presumably making a good amount of money. And if he's taken from other people's work, that's unethical. So, you know, it, it's, it, it calls for, it calls for a direct uh, answer. And, and if he's not, because I don't want, I don't, you know, I want him to re respond and maybe clarify the matter. If he's not taking from somebody else's work, I would just like to hear what, what he is doing. You know, I, I would just yeah. like an explanation because if he can explain it and say, well, here's, here's what happened. Here's what I did. And, and it, and it checks out. Okay. That's great. That's yeah, why I'm yeah. not accusing of anything. I'm just asking questions because I'm concerned and I would like to just hear a response because, and I think that people are, owed a response when it seems like you're doing something if that's not the case then just please come out and, and explain why that that isn't the case and what you are doing no exactly yeah um so it's, since we already mentioned dodd maybe we can flip the order instead of we can put fatima after todd uh since we're already kind of on the dodd issue um, if, if nobody has any objections to that no i'm, I'm fine with you going forward with dodd then going to fatima oh. it's fine either way yeah. All right. Um, Bella Dodd, as I said, was a communist lawyer in the 1930s, 1940s, and uh, she was a, a, a actual lawyer for the Communist Party. She was ca baptized Catholic as a young child in Italy. She was Italian, but she uh, she came over to the United States in the 1910s, I think, um, and uh, got up involved in communism. Taught at Hunter College in New York. Uh, Dr. Alice von Hildebrand knew Bella Dodd, and Alice Van Hildebrand also worked at Hunter College as well, uh, after Bella Dodd, I think. Um, and she eventually started having a crisis of conscience while in the party. She was seeing things that she didn't agree with, and they eventually expelled her on very spurious grounds, but um, in 19, 1949. And uh, she was still a very hardened communist at heart, until she came back to the church in 1952 under the auspices of uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen. Of course, later Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Um, and she gave, she gave her life over, the remainder of her life, which was about 16, 17, 18 years or so, to trying to undo the harm that she had done as a communist. She went around the country giving lectures she was a very gifted speaker, very gifted educator, uh, taught in the New York school system, of course. Well, she became very famous uh, in the year 2000, more, really more so in the year 2000 onward within Catholic circles, or kind of maybe a renewed fame might be the better, better way to say it, because in that year, November of 2000, there was a, a publication in Great Britain called Christian Order, and if I may once again share my screen, if that's okay. Uh, I have a picture or a graphic here of um, the actual beginning of the online edition, Christian Order. It was It's called The Greatest Conspiracy, and it was written by the editor, 
which at that time, and still is, I believe today, a gentleman named Rod P. Um, and I'm very, I just, I have to put a plug in. I have communicated with Mr. P. He was, he was, a, he was a perfect gentleman, very nice to me, answered my questions. We dialogued, it was a wonderful conversation. Or as a certain very famous person, but he was a perfect phone call, it's a perfect message. <laughs> um, well, long story short, this uh, Mr. P is talking in this article about basically infiltration of the Catholic Church. So this topic of infiltration was discussed long before Marshall's book of this of this title. Well, we see here in the second paragraph. Let me try to blow it up here a little bit for everybody. He, uh, well, uh, Mr. P is talking about um, the Belladad and some of the infiltration. You know, it's not cooperating here, but um, he talks about Douglas Hyde, who also made statements to the effect of infiltrating. Um, but let's see, he said, uh, the, uh, P says, ex-communist and celebrated convert Douglas Hyde revealed long ago that in the 1930s, the communist leadership issued a worldwide directive about infiltrating the Catholic Church. While in the early 1950s, Mrs., it wasn't Mrs., it was Dr., with all due respect, Dr. Bella Dodd was also providing detailed explanations of the communist subversion of the church. Speaking as a former high-ranking official of the American Communist Party, Mrs. Dodd said, quote, in the 1930s, we put 1,100 men into the priesthood in order to destroy the church from within. And then the editor, uh, Pede, says the idea was for these men to be ordained and progress to positions of influence and authority as monsignors and bishops. A dozen years before Vatican II, she stated that, quote, right now they are in the highest places in the church, where they were working to bring about change in order to weaken the church's effectiveness against communism. She also said that these changes would be so drastic that you will not recognize the Catholic Church. And that's where that paragraph ended. But here's the thing, though. Um, this is actually uh, become a legend. It's been passed around the internet. You'll notice that there's no citations. There's no footnote or endnote or nowhere I can go. So that was one of the reasons why I contacted Mr. P. And I said, could you help me out here? Like, where did you draw this stuff from? Well, and I, don't, I hope this doesn't get you into trouble, Mr. Lofton, because uh, I understand that one of your, some of your critics are, are associated with the person I'm about to name. But um, Mr. Peed was drawing from a, like a, a newsletter that was published by Brother Joseph Natale, who was the founder of a community in New Jersey that is now run by the Diamond Brothers. And uh, they, but Brother Natale in his article was talking about um, how he listened to Bella Dodd for four hours. He doesn't say where, and that's a key point. He doesn't say where. He listened to her for four hours, and she was allegedly talking about all of the, the plan to help how the communists were, were going to infiltrate the church, what the end game was, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the quote pulled up here in front of me. Um, but that quote later becomes attributed to what people call the Fordham Lecture. Well, I, I and saying that Bella Dodd said in 1953 at a lecture in Fordham, in Fordham. Well, I'm here to reveal to, uh, on your program, I believe this is probably a first time that this will be revealed on your show or anywhere, but um, Bella Dodd never gave a four-hour lecture at Fordham University. It, as far as we know, there's no proof. I have actually contacted the archives of Fordham University along, along with uh, a fellow researcher named Dr. Mary Nicholas, who has written a book presently under consideration for publication on Belladon, original research. Dr. Nicholas has gone to the communist library. She has dug up everything under the sun, and I've had the pleasure of reading the book in advance. And there's no proof of a four hour long lecture anywhere in the archives of Fordham University. But the only thing that is available, and I would like to pull it up here for you. Uh, so once again, I think I'll have to share my screen. This, there is a, a document available 
on the um, on the internet. It is the pay, the um, uh, a uh, let's see is it is it is it showing up on the screen yet? Um, let me scroll down. I think I yeah okay I, I had to scroll down before I see it. Oh, okay. There you go. Go ahead. Okay. This is a public, I believe it's the student newspaper called The Ram, and it is the edition of November 25th, 1953, number eight, volume 33. So you can see everything here. When you scroll down, it says here, Bella Dodd to speak on WFUV, which was the radio station, uh, still in existence. It says that Bella Dodd was supposed to give a talk at 11 a.m., presumably Eastern time, on December the 4th. Well, I doubt that this is the lecture that Brother Natale attended in 1953 because who is allowed to speak for four hours on a radio? That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we came close. We went to about three hours last week. But <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, the longest you know, show I did was three hours and 45 minutes. Now, oh, that was a solo you. show. That was me talking the whole time. <laughs> bless you. Um, <laughs> so, so we know she gave a radio talk in 1953 at 11 a.m., but that's not the same. Th it, the way Natalie describes it is he says, I listened to that woman for four hours, and I don't think that she sat for four, at a radio thing for four hours and broadcasted this. This is the only record anybody can find at this point in time, and I'm happy to say that, I'm the one who found it, and your show is the first ever to break this news, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, I might be wrong, but I, I think this is the first time. So it leads to questions. What is Natalie talking about? Where did When did this happen? Who has produced a transcript? Were there other people that, uh, that have affirmed this? This entire legend is based upon a newsletter from Natalie, and nobody has a copy of this. I asked Mr. Peed, I said, do you like have it? He says, Kevin, I have moved around so many times in 20 years, I'm paraphrasing. He says, I've moved around a lot in 20 years. He says, "It's if I have it still it's in a box somewhere, you know, if I ever find it, I'll let you know. And I'm like, well, that would be really, a pre that'd be really great because I'd like to know exactly what, what he says, um, if there's any more details. Because what we, what is available on the internet it, it doesn't demonstrate that Bella Dodd actually gave a four-hour talk at Fordham University, known as the Fordham Lecture. There is one talk that she gave that is mislabeled on YouTube as the 1953 lecture, but that when you actually look at the internal evidence from the video, it could not possibly be the Fordham Lecture. For one thing, she doesn't talk about the things that Natalie says that she did. So we can make of it what we will, but there are some, there are some holes in this, in this story. So how does this come back then to Marshall is on page 85, he's talking about Bella Dodd's um, involvement with communism and how uh, part of her effort at, make, at doing penance really and do, making good, good on the harm that she had done was she gave testimony to US Congress. He says, um, Bella Dodd testified, uh, page 85, testified before the US House Committee on Un-American Activities Committee in 1953 about the subversive ways in which communists tried to infiltrate American institutions. She originally converted to communism, quote, because only the communists seemed to care about what was happening to people in 1932 and 1933. They were fighting hunger and misery and fascism then, and neither the major political parties nor the churches seemed to care. That is why I am a communist, end quote. Well, right there we have a problem. Notice how he prefaces this by saying Bella Dodd says that she testified in 1953 before Congress, and then he gives this quote. There's no citation, and he makes you believe that she said this in 1953. It's not possible, because she says right there, that is why I am a communist. She was no longer a communist in 1953. So we have sloppy sourcing here. There was no sourcing, period. Um, then he talks about how um, in the 1930s, communist agents in the, in the United States followed directives from Moscow. One such order from Russia was to destroy the Catholic Church from within by planting communist party members in seminaries and in diocesan positions. 
Dodd testified that, quote, in the 1930s, we put 1,100 men into the priesthood in order to destroy the church from within, and that right now they are in the highest places in the church. Now, get this. Here we do have a citation. Number 46, footnote, bottom of page 85, Bella Dodd, lecture at Fordham University in 1953, recorded audio tape, lecture referenced in C.P. Trussell, Article Bella Dodd asserts Red's got presidential advisory posts, New York Times, March 11th, 1953. You can guess what I'm about to do. I, you, the New York Times has made their their um, many of their art, old articles available online, and guess what article happens to be available online? The Bella Dodd asserts Red got presidential advisory posts. And I have here um, the uh, a P, uh, a PDF, pardon me, a, a picture image of both pages of this um, of this of this article by Mr. Trussell. This is the first page. Bella Dodd asserts Red's got presidential advisory posts. And then, oh, pardon me, you can see here continued on page nine, column one. Here it is. Everybody can read it for themselves. There's a little part that gets cut off here. I apologize about that, but it doesn't, it still doesn't show anything. But here it is. Marshall says, Bella Dodd recorded audio tape. Her lecture was referenced by Trussell's article. I defy, I don't challenge, I defy anybody to read this article by Mr. Trussell and show me where he says, Bella Dodd gave a lecture in 1953 at Fordham University, and there's an audio tape. It's nowhere in the article. Nothing. It doesn't exist. It's pulled out of thin air. Or otherwise lending credence to the idea that this is just a copy-paste job. How he got this, I don't know. But the quote about the 19... Having said that now, the quote about the 1930s, that goes back to the Christian Order article. That was published as we saw in 1930. Uh, pardon me, in um, in the year 2000 by, by Christian Order. But there's no source for that. Mr. Peed remembers it coming from Brother Natalie's article, which is currently unavailable. Um, that may sound quasi Amazon there. Currently unavailable. <laughs> um, so we we have um, th there are some problems here because now what Marshall does is. He says that he starts he starts tying in Bella Dodd with the Alta Vendita, uh, Vendita, excuse me. Um, somebody corrected me on that, by the way, last week. Thank you on how to properly pronounce the word. He says, quote, Marshall, as a former communist agent in America, Dodd's testimony echoes perfectly the strategy mapped out in the Alta Vendita. And then he talks about Manning Johnson's testimony. And he, but here Marshall does something he should not have done. He says, African-American agent Manning Johnson also testified before the U.S. House Committee on American Activities in 1953 regarding Russian communists infiltrating the Catholic priesthood. He then proceeds to give a quote, this is page 86, uh, attributing this to Manning. And he says, quoting Manning, once the tactic of infiltration of religious organizations was set by the Kremlin, dot, 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 the communists discovered that the destruction of religion could proceed much faster through infiltration of the, and then Marshall puts the word Catholic in brackets, church by communists operating within the church itself, et cetera, et cetera. And he, he does give a citation here to uh, page two, 2278 of the U.S. Committee's uh, book on the subject. Well, uh, again, I'm going to share my screen. Um, this book was digitized, and it's available on archive.org, Internet Archive Wayback Machine's website. And here is page 2278, right here, blown it up for everybody. He does indeed, uh, he does talk about, Manning Johnson does talk about um, infiltrating. We see it right here. I think I can blow this up, you know. The communist leadership in the United States realized that the infiltration tactic, et cetera, et cetera, in this country would have to adapt itself, et cetera. But he's not talking about exclusively Catholicism. And that's a problem because this ties into other things that Bella Dodd talked about publicly. 
communism had a, a larger uh, focus with respect to infiltrating religious organizations, including different churches, not just the Catholic Church. It was known as Operation Outstretched Hand. Communism believed the Catholicism to be its uh, top priority, but it's not, it wasn't the exclusive priority. There's still a lot of scholarship being done in this area, and uh, so we have to be very careful. The documentation is not totally available just yet, but it's coming more and more with each passing year as people are dying and leaving their testimonies and or otherwise government making documents available. But the problem here that I want to stress is that it's not just Catholicism, but Marshall is conflating it and making it more than what it actually is because that's how it fits uh, into his thesis. Now he even, he even reiterate, he says, here we have, bottom page A6, here we have sworn testimony by former communist agents that the Kremlin was strategically placing their own men in American and European seminaries so as to infiltrate the Catholic priesthood and that it was, quote, a successful beyond even communist expectations, end quote, all before 1953. Well, again, this is it gets into some of the funny areas because it's it's much more complicated and convoluted than that. And Marshall's trying to make it very simple, and it, it's not that simple. I don't want to oversimplify it, but at the same time, it's like, well, there's a little bit more going on here. Now, I mentioned earlier the role of Dr. Alice von Hildebrand, who herself is a titan in Catholic life and thought. Wonderful, beautiful woman. Um. She was friend. Her and her husband Dietrich were friends, and with Bella Dodd. And one day, uh, Bella Dodd was—I think she was over at the von Hildebrands' home in New Rochelle—and they were talking. And uh, Marshall characterizes the conversation as an interview. That's a mistake. It wasn't an interview, and he does it on page eighty-seven. Um, Dietrich von Hildebrand is lamenting the state of the church to Bella Dodd, and he says to her, "I fear the church has been infiltrated." Uh, Bella Dodd says, you fear it, dear professor, I know it. When I was an ardent communist, I was working in close contact with four cardinals in the Vatican working for us, and they are still very active today. Who are they? My nephew is, the Ger is a German stationed at the Holy See. And uh, Marshall takes this from the article in 1 Peter 5, Alice von Hildebrand sheds a new light on Fatima. Well, um, I, I've, I've, I've composed an essay and it's available on my website, that goes into this. But Bella Dodd herself actually stated, and I'm quoting her, we have it her in an audio lecture. She says, and I quote, I never met a communist who was a member of the Catholic clergy. Those are her words, Detroit, September the 1st, 1961. This, the, the tape is archived at the Bentley Historical Library at the University of Michigan. I mean, very clear what the sources are, but it knows exactly where you can go. Um, anybody can act, anybody who's a researcher can, can look this up. I just did a couple of months ago myself. Um, but it was given to me originally by somebody else. And I nearly fell off this very chair when I heard Bella Dodd say this, because I'm like, wait, what? That flies in the face of everything that we've ever known. Well, I looked at all of the available evidence and I don't think it entirely contradicts things that we know. Uh, Bella Dodd had, uh, had said or did because other friends of hers were still alive, uh, no, most notably um, Johnine and Paul Leininger of Texas. Now, here I'm going to have another reveal. I'm actually friends with the Leiningers. I went to Franciscan University of Steubenville with either, I think it was the nieces or nephews or the grandchildren of the Leiningers. And then my first teaching job I lived very close to them, and we had mutual friends, one of whom just died last week, actually. His name was Paul. Please pray for him. Um, very wonderful man, very pro-life. So I got to, I got to meet the Leiningers, and I, I visited their home. Um, Paul died in 2015, I believe, or, or 2017. He had, a, he had had a stroke not uh, sometime before that, but I believe John Ian is still alive, and I met with her. I was helping Dr. Nicholas with the research for her book on Bella Dodd. And I asked Johnine, would she listen to an audio recording of Bella Dodd, allegedly Bella Dodd, and would she confirm if this is Bella Dodd's voice or not? 
So it was, it was a very pregnant moment. I was sitting in my car. I had my phone, not this one, but the previous one. And it was connected to my, to my, to the, the, my car. And Johnine leaned through. My car door was open. For a path, the, the driver door was open. She leaned in and I had it played as loud as I could. <laughs> and it was, a very, it was a very pregnant pause. As she, and I, I was almost biting my nails. Um, and she, she, was, she, was lean, she leaned in. She listened, and then all of a sudden she stood up. She had a smile on her face, and she's and these are her exact words. I remember this day. She said, she said, yes, she said, yep, that's Bella Dodd. That's my that's my friend, that's Bella Dodd. So we have an odd we have a witness who heard Bella speak say, that's her voice now. And so we knew who we knew how to identify it now. Um I didn't mention all of this in my essay because. I didn't want to make it too personal. I thought this would be a better platform to do all of this. But why do I say all of this? I am very much involved in this story. I have, I guess you can say, an interest in it because I'm friends with the people who wrote an affidavit, signed it, and had it notarized saying that Bella Dodd gave a talk in Orange County, California. We were there, and this is what she told us about having, you know, the communism in the church, et cetera, et cetera. And that affidavit had been published by Toby Westerman uh, for International News Today, I think was the name of the publication. And it made its rounds there around 2003 to 2007. It went off the internet somehow, I don't know how, but I was able to bring it back uh, in this article. Um, and John Ian herself provided me a copy of it in 2015 when I went back to visit her. Um, so, uh, she was with her, I think her nephew, Guy, I think I think was his first name. Uh, they were in the truck, and I got a picture of her sitting in the truck. Um, it was rather nice. But um, so we know that Bella Dodd said these things. But when we got access to that Detroit lecture, we heard that comment. Previously, all of this information about Bella Dodd was people who said, Bella Dodd said, but now we have a direct statement, which takes precedence in the order of evidence. Uh, Bella Dodd herself saying, I never met a communist who was a member of the Catholic clergy. So how do we reconcile all of this? And that's what my essay was all about. Um, Massive Ages, a publication over in Britain, has just published a condensed version of that essay. And as I put, it's, um, it should be live actually in about six minutes on my website, because <laughs> uh, I, I I queued it so that it was ready to go during the, during today's broadcast. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that we're that we're looking at. It's new, it's original, it's fresh. If there's one thing I want people to walk away from in the Bella Dodd conversation uh, component to all of this, it is that we can't dogmatize things right now. We're uh, we're too close to the historical events. The information is not. Uh, readily available as we would like to have it. And so we have to be extremely careful about what we say. There's a certain respect that has to be given these topics because otherwise, if you don't give it the sensitive treatment that it deserves, you're going to make it pejorative. And for people it, such as myself and, and like Dr. Mary Nicholas and others that are doing that serious research, you're actually giving them a bad name. You're, you're making it pejorative, thinking that you're wearing the tinfoil hats, like in the movie Signs, you know, with Mel Gibson and, and, and the kids. Um, and you bring disrepute to the top, to a very sensitive subject. Because as, as I've been consistent all along, I don't disagree with Marshall's thesis, but it's really not his thesis, actually. It's other people's that that's, he's been writing about, that, the, that there was infiltration in the, within the church. How he has argued it, that's where I really have some some deep issues, uh, and the Bella Dodd is, issue was one part of it. There, there are other areas that we'll be getting to tonight, so I, I'll probably just kind of close out there on that on that note. <laughs> um, no, th this was excellent. River, did you have any uh, comments there? Um, on the details, no. Kevin covered the details far better than me. Um, on the implications, there's so. Just historically, it's really weird to align communism and Freemasonry at all. Uh, Freemasonry is historically uh, a bourgeois uh, political movement. It's for the middle and upper classes. 
Uh, it almost always, every place it appears, uh, shows up as a uh, revolutionary movement in favor of liberal values, um, constitutionalism, uh, sort of John Lockean kind of economics, uh, you know, broad liberal capitalism. Uh, communism uh, is a proletarian workers' movement uh, that then tends into uh, tyranny uh, when it gets activated, but these two revolutionary factions don't have the same ends at all. Uh, in fact, in the Soviet Union, uh, they banned Freemasons uh, and persecuted them. In China, Freemasons are still banned. Um, generally speaking, in Italy, um, Freemasons uh, and, uh, which we can get to later when we talk about Bumini, Freemasons and the Communist Party um, were in a, a deep uh, disalliance. And in fact, the Communist Party in Italy aligned with the um, largely Catholic Christian Democratic Party to uh, uh, ban them from public life. Uh, so the, the this quick and easy alliance between communists and Freemasons doesn't make a lot of sense at all, which leads me to believe that Marshall doesn't know anything about the history of these political movements that he's talking about. Um, and he's got, I, he has no relation to them at all. He, he just, he aligns them philosophically in terms of naturalism, but I mean, you can have two people philosophically aligned that fight all the time. Uh, Protestants and I agree on plenty of things theologically. I mean, we have conflict. Eastern Orthodox and, and Catholics agree on a lot more things uh, and have vicious uh, conflict. So the idea that you have a communist and then they're a natural ally of a Freemason, it makes no sense. Or somebody who's Freemasonic is is also kind of doesn't make sense. It's it's silly and weird. On top of that, on his actual story, the cardinals that he puts forward as possible communists don't connect to the cardinals that he puts forward later as infiltrators. It, it's not it's not Bea and Bunini and I forget who the third guy is. Uh, it's three other possible communist cars. They don't seem to have any alliance or connection at all. So uh, I don't understand how this, these two parts of his narrative pace together at all. Um, and it's, that's it's, a, that's, it's a real disjunct. River, that's actually one of the problems. It was, uh, it was Montini, Bea and uh, Bonini. Yeah. And they're not the communist three. The Holy Trinity, if you will. That's kind of how Marshall paints them out to be in the book. And actually that's, uh, there's some questions there about how he, how he characterizes right. the three. Um, in fact, he seems to call uh, Bunini a communist, which makes no sense. If he, he can't be a Freemason and a communist, especially if he's in certain parts of Freemason, that wouldn't work. It doesn't make sense. So it's it's just wrong. He's confused. Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of confusion. Respectfully speaking, I should say there's a lot of confusion within infiltration, and I'm trying to remember that thought. I I noted it in the book when I was going through it in my in making notes in pencil, but it was something to the effect of how um, he characterized them as basically being in cahoots with one another. And oh, that's right, I remember that they were the three kingpins behind the 1958 conclave and ousting Siri. That's right. I remember now. And I remember reading that and thinking to myself, oh, my goodness, are we really going to get into the Siri thesis here? Oh, please. Uh, but but I'm like, how would Bunini possibly have a say in the conclave? You know, uh, it, it just didn't make any sense. It, 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 it's just Bunini is made into the boogeyman, the proverbial whipping boy in Marshall's book. And he puts entirely two, he actually makes Bunini more important than he actually was, at least in the PN years. So it's just, it's absurd. It, even, it's, in the, even in the reform years, you can read Bunini's own journals on this, and he's clearly frustrated about his position. He's clearly frustrated that he has to work through a lot of different people. He talks about who he had to deal with. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but we'll get to that when we get to the liturgy. We don't have to dwell on that this moment. We still need to do Fatima before we get to that. Yeah. Yes. Well, go go ahead and take it wherever you want, Kevin. Okay. Well, all right. Well, um, I am a I am essentially a Fatima scholar, and so this is a topic near and dear to my heart. 
I will be published soon by the Sanctuary of Fatima in one of its official publications. So um, it, it's a very serious thing for me, this topic. Um, but real quick, I see somebody in the chat says that I claim Bunini is for sure a Freemason, but I'm fairly sure this is still disputed. So the person that said that, I don't claim it. Father Charles Murr claimed it, and I reported on it in an article for Inside the Vatican. So I want to be very clear. I go by what Father Murr said, who was the personal secretary to Cardinal Gagnon, who was the, who was the apostolic visitator to the Roman Curia in the 1970s. So I take his witness very seriously. So I want to be clear what the source is for that. All right, moving on. Um, Fatima. Uh, in 1917, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to three young children in uh, Fatima, Portugal. And uh, for, uh, roughly the 13th of every month, except in August, uh, from May to October 1917. And in July of that year, Our Lady communicated a secret to the children. And the secret was later revealed to be in three parts. The first two were published by 1941-1942, but the last was written down in 1944, but not revealed to the world until the year 2000. Lots of speculation took place there. But long story short, it was a very profound uh, apparition. Of, appar there were very profound apparitions of Our Lady because they culminated in this great miracle of the sun in October 13th, 1917, where the sun was moving in the sky, defying all cosmic laws, and that looked like it was going to be crashing into the earth. People thought the end of the world was going to happen. And then when the, when the sun went back to its place in the sky, it had, been pre it had previously been raining. And every, the, the ground, the clothes, everything was drenched. But when the sun returned to its spot in the sky, everything was bone dry. So very profound ex uh, mystical experience there. There were three children, Jacinta Francisco Marto and Lucia, do, Lucia dos Santos. They were, uh, Francisco and Jacinta were cousins, uh, uh, brother, sister, excuse me, and Lucia was their cousin. So that's a quick background. Well, um, Marshall talks about these apparitions because Our Lady gave some very serious warnings in the secret of Fatima in its three parts. Mm -hmm. The first part of the secret was a vision of hell. The second part was a revelation regarding the devotion to a devotion to the Immaculate Heart that God wished to institute in the world. And then the third part of the secret is still debated about how we should speak about it. Um, I have my way of speaking about it based upon my research and studies. But suffice it to say that Everybody wanted to know what this third part of the secret was supposed to be. People thought it was supposed to be revealed in the year 1960, and it didn't happen. And all kinds of legends and stories and sensationalism happened. And unfortunately, Marshall gets caught up in those errors. Uh, this, mind you, this book was published in May of 2019. I have a whole book talking about the third part of the secret of Fatima, in which I debunk a lot of these sensational narratives and um, and I investigate a lot of these claims. That book was published in May of 2017, an entire two years prior. Um, and I can personally confirm on your show that uh, Taylor Marshall did know about my book because he and I had a conversation on the phone back in September of 2018. Not only did I tell him about my St. Michael book, but we also talked about my Fatima book, our one and only conversation that we ever had. I was sitting in my room at the seminary when he called me, uh, or, or when we spoke on the phone, I should say. So he did He did have knowledge of my book, and that's important. So he begins talking about uh, the apparitions of an angel. He says that, it, that those apparitions happened in 1916. Well, that's actually not known for a fact. Lucia herself wasn't sure if it was 1915 or 1916. So right there, there's no qualification, and then there's some, some problems there. <clears throat> then he talks about the um, apparitions of Fatima. This begins on page 55, by the way. Um, he takes, for his, for his recounting of the narrative of Fatima and what took place in the apparitions, he depend, Marshall depends upon uh, a document from EWTN, and immediately I thought that was a bit sketch. 
because Sister Lucia, who lived to be almost 100 years old, wrote her memoirs about the events. But he doesn't actually go by the memoirs. He goes by this, this document on EWTN. And with all due respect to EWTN, whatever that translation that they had was terrible. You know, um, it, it was just awful. Um, so I'll give you an example here, and I'll put it. I'll show. I'll put the picture up to the screen here. On page sixty-three, you can see here's one of the texts that he's quoting from, and you can see I, I take my pencil and I'm just tearing through the English because I have to, I own the Portuguese, and uh, and I'm going over it, and I'm go, I'm I'm going. This this is not correct. So if you have a bad translation, you're going to likely have bad conclusions later on. But now, backing up, um, there's omissions in the translation, too. Our Lady said that this, a woman named Amelia would be in purgatory until the end of the world. That's completely omitted in Marshall's rendition here. Um, I think that was just because he was going by EWTN's uh, thing, though. Um, so, uh, again, some little inaccuracies. I won't go into the whole, I won't go into every little uh, jot and tittle of everything that... Um, that that I could you know little little qu uh, qu quibbles and whatnot, but there 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 are some the translation brings about issues of how you understand Fatima. Um, so it's um, I find it actually kind of weird because I would think that in, with the conspiracy mind of that Marshall has, given how many inaccuracies there are, I'm not I'm actually kind of surprised that Marshall doesn't turn around and say that EWTN is involved in a conspiracy to, you know, downplay the message of Fatima. <laughs> this has happened. I'm not lying. I'm not making this up. This has happened before with other very Fatima-minded people. I won't say who they are, but I've seen it with my own two eyes. Um, so here's the first big mistake. Page 64. Quote, the vision of hell and the consecration of Russia are the first and second parts of the secret of Fatima. No, no, no. It wasn't the consecration of Russia as the second part of the secret. That's the wrong way to talk about it. It is the devotion to the Immaculate Heart. That is the second part of the secret of Fatima. Everything else is connected to that, including the question of the consecration of Russia. Then he says, the controversial third part, which followed, was so horrific and terrible that it could not be revealed until 1960. That is absolute bunk. Absolute nonsense. No, Our Lady commanded in 1917, July 13th, do not tell this to anyone. Yes, you may tell Francisco. Francisco could see but not hear Our Lady and, and the vision. So uh, Our Lady had commanded that it not be told. So right there, we have a question of obedience. It had nothing to do with if it was terrifying or not. That is nothing but pure sensationalism on Marshall's part. But that, that characterization of the third part is not original to Marshall. That goes back to two people. And this is what I demonstrate in my book. Father Joaquin Maria Alonso, CFM, one of the um, Florentian fathers, he was the first Fatima archivist who made a terrible mistake in one of his books, which was then picked up by a French writer named Fray Michel de la Sainte Trinité. That error goes back to that. Hopefully we'll get to, I want to go into a little bit more uh, into that a little bit later. One saving grace that Marshall does do at the top of page 65, he says, quote, it is best to see the secret of Fatima as one united secret with three interrelated parts. That is a saving grace. I will do Marshall some honor here. That is actually very true. Unfortunately, he doesn't see that to its natural end. But this is critical because it's not that they are three individual things, it's they are one It's one secret, three parts. So we have to interpret one in the context of the other. That's how it's meant to be done. Even Father Alonso himself talks about that in his book, La Verdad Sobre el Secreto de Fatima, um, from 1976. Now, page 65, Marshall says, quote, in October 1943, the bishop of Leria, Fatima that is, ordered Lucia, under obedience, to put the third secret into writing, which she hesitated to do because of its shocking contents. That's a lie. That's not true. 
That is a mischaracterization of what happened. Sister Lucia wrote the third part, had struggled, struggled to write down the third part of the secret because Our Lady had told her in 1917, do not tell this to anyone. But now the bishop was telling her to write it down. Well, by this point, sister is, is, sister is a Dorothean religious nun, and she was accustomed, as she wrote to, as one of her letters, that if one of her superiors gave her an order, that was as if it came from God himself. So now she's like, who do I, who do I obey? The bishop or Our Lady? You know, who, who do I obey? That's why she couldn't write it down. We know this because Sister Lucia herself said this in one of her letters. But the, this characterization, this false characterization, comes from an imprudent remark made by Father Alonso in his book, La Verdad Sobre el Secreto de Fatima, uh, from 1976, in which he gives a wild speculation and in which he totally forgets about this letter from Lucia earlier in the book that he himself provided. It's great. The details are in my book, but people see it there. He also says on January 2nd, 1944, Our Lady of Fatima appeared to Lucia and gave her permission to write down the third secret, but to have it sealed until 1960 because it will be clearer then. Okay, first, it wasn't January 2nd. It was January 3rd, 1944. That's another common error that we now have correction on. Um, Our Lady did appear and gave permission for Lucia to write down the third part of the secret, but we Marshall didn't qualify his words here. Lucia was given permission in that apparition of early January 1944 to write what they command you, but not that which is given to you to understand of its meaning. So later when the text is revealed, it describes a vision, but there's no explanation. We know why now, because Our Lady had told her not to do that. So this is not, it's not qualified. Um, but Our Lady didn't tell her it will be clearer then in 1960. That's not what Lucia says. So that's that's not clear. Marshall then makes another error in which he says further on page 865, Lucia then wrote the secret down and sealed it in an envelope. This sealed envelope would in 1955 be transferred to Rome and wait to be opened by Pope John XXIII in 1959. It wasn't 1955, it was 1957. More on that a little bit later. Um, another little minor error on page 66, Marshall says that on the 19th of August, Lucia, her brother John, and Francisco were tending sheep in a different area. Um, and uh, no, it wasn't Lucia's brother. It was Francisco and Jacinta's brother, Joao uh, Marto, who died uh, only about 20 years ago. He, he died in 1999, 2000. Um, so again, just another little... And that was one of the little foible, but it it shows sloppiness and not 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 uh, no, no real care. Um, then uh, Marshall then says, bottom of page sixty nine. Last of all, Lucia alone saw the lady once more. This time, resembling Our Lady of Mount Carmel. This de the depiction of Our Lady of Mount Carmel signifies the glorious queenship of Mary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, no, Our Lady appeared to her as Our Lady Mount Carmel because Sister Lucia was meant to become a Carmelite religious, and this was a foreshadowing of her vocation as a Carmelite. Um, but to be fair, to, again, to be fair, that is a popular way of understanding that apparition. That's not unique to Marshall's understanding. I know Father Andrew Apostoli talked about it with John at Benkovich on Women of Grace uh, some years ago. And so it's a popular interpretation but with the advent of the Carmelites of Coimbra's biography of Sister Lucia, we now know that that's more connected to Sister Lucia's vocation. So continuing on page 670, Marshall says that Our Lady appeared for a seventh and final visit in Fatima in 1920 before Lucia left for boarding school. It wasn't 1920, it was 1921. Um, let's see. He, Marshall doesn't write about her being a Dorothy and not, he, makes, he does make a mistake there. Um, he also says that everybody present at the miracle of the sun saw the sun moving and spinning. That's actually not true. Not everybody there present saw it. We have sworn testimony to that effect. And I, I have one of the books around here somewhere that talks about that. Um, uh, let's see. In this chapter it's, uh, itself, where he's talking about Our Lady of Fatima, um, he, he kind of sets the stage um, for later discussions. 
So when you move a little bit further into the book, uh, on page 97, chapter 11, Marshall begins uh, a new chapter called Pius XII is the Pope of Fatima. Um, he bring, begins talking about, about one of the specific prophecies in the second part of the secret that Our Lady talks about. The Second World War will begin, uh, or the next world war, war would happen under the reign of Pius XI. There's been some historical contestation about that. Um, but uh, as he's continuing the story about Fatima in the, in the 1930s, uh, I, generally it's it's pretty straightforward. I don't I don't have too many things uh, to point out, except he does talk about bottom of page 102, the Father Schmeigel story. Uh, he claims that Pius XII sent a a, a, um, a a priest named Father Joseph Schweigel to the Carmel of Coimbra to get information from Sister Lucia. Um, that is kind of a sticking point in Fatima history right now, admittedly, because we don't have the documentation from Schweigel. It's currently sitting at the in the archives of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and we're not at the 80-year period just yet. We have to wait another 10 years before that documentation can become available under Vatican rules. Uh, 80 years is the period for that. So it's an open question. That's admittedly an open question, but um, I would like to point out something about that. I have looked into it a little bit, as much as I can, at least. Um, I want to say that the Schweigel story is all oral tradition. It comes filtered to us uh, through Frère Michel de la Santa Trinité, who I mentioned earlier, and they, they come from a gentleman who was one of his co his, his confreres at the Russicum in Rome, uh, the Russicum, and uh, it was recounted 30 years after the fact. I don't know about the reliability of this, and a lot of people have been banking on this uh, because he makes a he makes a, the reason why it's a big deal is because he says that I cannot reveal anything of what I learned at Fatima con concerning the third secret, but I can say that it has two parts. One concerns the Pope. The other, logically, although I must say nothing, would have to be the continuation of the words, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, which was the ending of the second part, not the beginning of the third part of the secret. Marshall then goes into talking about more with the liturgy, the crypto-modernists during the waning years of Pius the, the, the Twelfth, and this is where he gets back in Fatima. Um, he says that Pius XII sent Cardinal Ottaviani, the head of the Holy Office, now Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, on May 17, 1955, to talk to Sister Lucia about the contents of the, of the, the envelope, aka the third secret Fatima, third part of the secret. Um, and then he makes this claim, quote, at the top of page 108, as a result of Ottaviani's interview with Lucia, the Holy See asked Lucia's bishop to transfer the third secret, still sealed in an envelope, to the Vatican in April 1957. Okay, first, uh, this is a very weak area of knowledge in Fatima history. The only person that, to the best of my knowledge, that wrote about this was a Portuguese priest named Father Jose uh, Freire, uh, Freire um, Jose Geraldes Freire, who was a gentleman and a scholar. He only passed away a few years ago. A uh, very honorable man. Um, but the, there was a directive from Rome to the Bishop of Fatima saying, we want copies of all the documents. And this is the sticking point. This is, this, is one of the, this is one of those areas where Marshall didn't get it right. Rome did not ask for the third part of the secret itself to be transferred to Rome. The Holy See requested copies of all documents. Big distinction there. Um, but the Bishop of Fatima, uh, Don Jose, the, Don Jose de, de Silva, gave orders that the original text of the third part be shipped off. No copy was to be made because it was sealed in an envelope. No copy. He was, he was begged, make a copy, Bishop, please. If this gets out of our hands, we'll lose the opportunity. He said, no, nope, send the original. And he did. So the fate of the third part of the secret of Fatima was governed by Don Jose's desire not to want to mess with heaven's secrets, as he kind of alluded to it. But now we have an issue because Our Lady had said that this envelope can only be opened in 1960, Queso Poggio in Portuguese is, is the, are the words, by the Cardinal Patriarch of Lisbon, 
or the Bishop of Fatima. Now, that's not to say that the Pope himself couldn't do it. But once it left Portuguese control, it was subject to uh, whatever Rome understood of the topic. And admittedly, there was some flawed information there on Rome's part. It didn't understand the whole story. That's that's a scholar. Now that's not to Rome's insult. It's just they just didn't know. Um, so we continue on now, and this is another one of the great problems of Fatima. Marshall says the Bishop Venancio, who was the auxiliary of Luria, quote noted that the sealed envelope containing one contained one sheet of paper with twenty five lines of written text with three fourth centimeter margins on both sides. That's not true. Uh, Bishop uh, uh, Venancio did not state that the text was 20 to 25 lines. He never said it. Uh, I may have said this on another program, but uh, I'll say it here. I have been to the archives of Fatima. I am allowed, I am allowed to study there, at least before COVID. <laughs> and uh, I, can re I can tell you that uh, Bishop Venancio left a document, a reproduction, in the archives of Fatima, I've held this document in my hands, and he wrote on the outside, I believe it was in blue pen, what he saw when he held up the envelopes to the light and you know what he could see. He never once stated the number of the lines of text. I've held this document in my hand, and I even, I even got a ruler on it. I took the measurements and I reproduced it. I have it somewhere here in my private files. All right, so returning, that, returning then to, um, uh, to what Marshall does here with Fatima, uh, he then kind of goes into talking about basically how evil Cardinal Montini, well, Archbishop Montini was, later Pope Paul VI, how he was friends with Jacques Maritain, uh, who introduced him to Saul Alinsky. Um, some big questions there. Admittedly, there are some questions there. Um, and he kind of, he kind of, ends up that chapter a little bit. Um, but now he gets in chapter 15, what happens when John, Pope John XXIII is elected Pope, and he opens the third part of the secret, then in Rome. Um, he talks about how John, Pope John XXIII had the third secret brought to him in Castel Gandolfo, the Pope's summer residence, on August 17th, 1959. But then Marshall throws a hit and dig at John the 23rd, he says, he, the Pope opened it, even though Lucia had instructed that it, quote, be open and read to the world either at her death or in 1960, whichever came first, end quote. This is why Pope Pius XII, who had custody of the sealed envelope, had never opened or read it. Um, well, John the 23rd opened it three and a half months before 1960. I don't think that's a real big deal. Um, I just don't, I don't, that's, no, that's not a big deal. But if if that wasn't clear, Marshall then says at the top of page 118, Pope John the 23rd disobeyed the inscription. He opened it one year early. No, it was three and a half months. <laughs> um, and then he makes another mistake. Marshall says, we cannot be certain, but John the 23rd's confessor at this time may have been Monsignor Alfredo Cavagna. Um... Yeah, we can be certain that was his confessor. The Vatican expressly stated it in the text where they where the booklet where they released the third part of Secret of Fatima. So with all due respect, Dr. Marshall, I don't think you did your homework here. Uh, then he says the Portuguese translated was Monsignor de Paulo Jose Tavares of the Secretary of State, which is true. Um, uh, afterward, John the Twenty Third responded only, quote, This does not concern my pontificate, end quote. That is not true. John the 23rd did not state that. What he said was, uh, he gave no judgment. He leaves it to others to decide. His successors, presumably. That's what his personal secretary, uh, Archbishop Lourdes Capovilla, who wrote down the dictation. He was the one who wrote it down. All, uh, that's what Capovilla said. Um, then Marshall commits another big, big... Uh, uh, problem. Also, he says, on 8 February 1960, 
A Vatican press release stated that the third secret would not be published in 1960 as expected, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it wasn't a Vatican press release. That is a mischaracterization of what this document was. It was a news article that appeared in um, in in a, in, uh, in Europe, and it, but it wasn't a Vatican press release. We don't even know who wrote the piece. First of all, um, that's that's one of the chapters. I have a whole chapter about that in my book. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, he also says that the Blessed Virgin Mary said or said that it was supposed to be that the text was supposed to be published in 1960. That's not what Our Lady said. Her words, as I said earlier, are que esto poja ser abierto en 1960. It can only be opened, abierto. She does not say published. That's a whole different, whole different word. She only talks about being it can being opened. Nothing about publishing. Um, let's see. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Then he gets into the question of the so-called fourth secret of Fatima on page 119. The fourth secret of Fatima is a hypothesis that says there is a second text written by Sister Lucia with explanatory words of the Blessed Virgin, or as Christopher Ferrara says, the missing soundtrack, wherein Our Lady explains the imagery of the vision of the third part of the secret. Um, Marshall gives different theories about this. Um, and uh, he says... Archbishop Loris Francesco Capovilla, private secretary to Pope John XXIII in 1959, claimed that he was present and saw Pope John XXIII break open the intact seal of the envelope in 1959 and read the third secret. Mr. Lofton, once again, you're getting an exclusive on your show. I've been working on the second edition of my book on the third part of Secret of Fatima, and I've entirely gutted chapter eight, and it's, an enti it's entirely new. And I br bring before you the draft of chapter eight, which is all about Capovilla. Capovilla said no such thing. He was not present when John the 23rd opened up the text, etc. Capovilla never claimed that. What I did was I have gone through and I've put all of Capovilla's known statements in chronological order and I review it. That will be chapter eight in these in the second edition of my book. But uh, Capovilla nowhere ever said that he saw John the Twenty Third break open the seals. He never never said it. Um, this is editorializing on Marshall's part. Uh, he also says, "Quote Marshall, it is the problem with Capovilla's testimony is that Bishop John Venancio previously testified that the third secret was on one sheet of paper. Yet the third secret released in two thousand is on four sheets of paper. No, it wasn't." It was one sheet of paper folded into fours, which was standard in Portugal at the time in the 1940s. Plus, it's wartime. They had to save paper. Um, this was expressly revealed by Cardinal Bertone uh, in 2007 on, on, on camera on an Italian program, Porta Porta, door to door. So, again, Marshall's not doing his homework. Um, he also makes the erroneous claim... Quote, we know from Lucia's fourth memoir that the third secret begins, quote, in Portugal, the dogma of faith will always be preserved, but the version of the third secret released in 2000 does not contain this phrase except in a footnote. That is not the beginning of the third part of the secret of Fatima. It is the ending of the second part. This was stated at the Vatican's press conference in the year 2000 by the Portuguese journalist Aura Miguel, whom I have met and I have spoken with her, consulted with her, dare I say, and she has personally confirmed all of this to me, um, and I don't I don't have the picture here, but I, have, I, I made sure to get a selfie with her before <laughs> before I left that day. Um, no, that is the beginning. That's the ending of the second part of the secret. How do we know this? Because Sister Lucia herself says in her memoirs, "I will write down everything except that part of the secret that I'm not supposed to tell you about." So that can't be the beginning of the third. She's not supposed to talk about it at that time. So it, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous thesis. Um, uh, let's see. He also mischaracterizes what the third part of the secret is. He says, it is about this on page 120. It is about the suffering and murder of the Pope. No, that is, that is lowballing it. The third part of the secret of Fatima is talking about people who were offering themselves to God in expiation 
for all of the sins that were going on for, from communism, fascism, all the totalitarian regimes, people who were making, uh, being faithful to Jesus Christ and his gospel as represented by the cross in the vision. They're being shot at and killed by, the, by, by soldiers in the vision. Um, it's a scene of martyrdom. That's what it is. It's not just about the suffering and murder of the Pope. That is, that is a squint. It's a fine squint. It's, a, it's an imperfect picture uh, of what the third part of the secret of Fatima is all about. It's much more profound than that. Um, so uh, he also talks about on page 122 uh, in respect to the fourth secret hypothesis. He says, the version of the third secret released in 2000 contains nothing about the dangers threatening the faith of the Christian because he's, he's uh, talking of something about Cardinal Ratzinger said in his famous Ratzinger report with the Italian journalist Vittor, uh, uh, Vittorio Missori in 1984. Well, Marshall doesn't, if again, if you have that limited vision of what the third part of secret is, that limited squint, you understand why, Mar it's, un it's easy to understand why Marshall doesn't understand why Ratzinger says what he says about the dangers threatening the life of the Christian. Our Lady talked about in the second part of the secret, the errors of Russia will spread if her requests are not heeded. Those errors are represented by the soldiers shooting the people in the scene of the third part of the secret with guns and bows and arrows. And they're being martyred. Our Lady says many good people will be martyred in the second part. That's what she says. So what's happening then is Ratzinger, if these errors are being spread throughout the world, they're choking the divine life, the theological virtues. They're choking the divine life in people because they're breathing in these errors. Is that not a danger threatening the life of the Christian? Like what Ratzinger says in the Ratzinger report? Total, misunder total misunderstanding the way um, Marshall puts this. But unfortunately, it's not. It, this isn't unique to him. He's parroting a talking point from if I'm allowed to am I allowed to say names? Yeah, go if it's not if it's not harmful in some way. Yeah, I don't no, know. Yeah, public, go ahead. It's public knowledge. Yeah, Marshall is Marshall is parroting talking points from from the Canadian priest Father Nicholas Gruner and one of his associates named Christopher Ferrara, and Ferrara has been on Marshall's podcast talking about Fatima. Again, that's all public knowledge. Um. But they lowbrow. I get kind of emotional when I talk about this because it's like you, you all are lowballing this. It's like Fatima light, and it, it's it's wretched. And I'm serious about that. It's wretched. So anyway, top of page 123, Marshall makes another area error. He says um, he's talking about Malachi Martin, the famous Malachi Martin. Um, and Malachi Martins claims that he, through Cardinal Bea, read the third part of the secret and took a vow of silence. Well, Malachi Martin was a good Irishman. I've been to Ireland, and I know Irish people can tell a good story. I love listening to Irish people tell a good story. It's great. Malachi Martin was an excellent storyteller, but he wasn't telling the truth here. We know this because Marshall says Malachi Martin claimed that two young Portuguese seminarians translated Sister Lucia's letter. It wasn't two. It was Monsignor de Paolo Tavares, one. And he was a minutante in the Secretary of State. He wasn't a seminarian. He was a priest, a, monsign a Monsignore, later Bishop of Massau. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, thankfully, Mar uh, Marshall at least says, uh, either Malachi Martin has invented a sensationalized version and placed himself into the events, or he was present at a second reading. Well, at least he kind of gave, he kind of threw you a bone. He kind of let you know at least somewhat that Malachi Martin might not be as totally truthful. Um, so these are just some of the things that we could say about, um, about Marshall with Fatima. I've kind of gone on a little bit, but uh, I know some of the criticism of last week's sh uh, ep part one was that it was a lot of like intellectual kind of heady stuff. Like I want book, chapter, verse, you know, 
Well, I've kind of just given you book, chapter, and verse. Uh, so I hope that it's kind of balanced it out a little bit more. Um, I I will yield the floor. I think there's more that could be said, but I, <laughs> I'll yield the floor. No, so, I, I appreciate it. Questions. And um, River, River uh, go ahead and take it wherever you want to go. Um, that's, that's pretty pretty exhaustive. Um, I guess the only thing I wanted to ask about, but since you're actually a scholar on this, is what – be, because this is used all the time, um, I think that Taylor has at least implicitly a certain theology of private revelation that's not valid. I think that he has a view of private revelation as a parallel magisterium. Um, and I, I want to know, if one, if you concur with that judgment and two, what the I, actual relationship I've, is. I've noticed the tendency of traditionalists to overemphasize private revelation, even over against, and I'm not saying that the private revelations necessarily conflict with the magisterium, but their interpretations of them sometimes conflict with the magisterium. I've noticed an overemphasis on private revelations and a de-emphasis of the magisterium. What's interesting is we hear a whole lot from some traditionalists these days about private revelations and yet very, very little about the post-conciliar magisterium. In fact, some of them are fairly explicit that they snub their nose at the post-conciliar magisterium. So in other words, they has they sometimes tend to have this disposition that they are opposed to the teaching authority of the church, but they have a very, very, very strong uh, tendency towards private revelation. So I, I do think that there is something to be said there. Uh, I saw a meme where Elmo was um, sitting on one side and it says scripture and tradition. And he's just sitting there just looking apathetic to scripture and tradition. And then on the other side, it says <laughs> random private Catholic revelations. And it has a bunch of powder all over the table and it has his head face down, snorting all this powder. And the idea is the elbows consuming all of this stuff, but not scripture tradition. I know it's somewhat of a crude meme, but there's a grain of truth to that. Uh, I don't know if you, you you want to comment on that, Kevin. I think it's rather funny myself, but yeah, it, it's. I'm I'm going to bring up the dangerous one, even though it's rejected by traditionalists uh, in the so-called Novus Ordo Church, uh, Medjugorje. Yeah, I, I one one writer characterized it as spiritual crack candy and uh i'm pretty it's pretty well known that i have a lot of questions about michigoria um but with respect to the tra to traditionalists and private revelation yes there is a very unhealthy dependence upon it because kind of like with that quote that i read earlier last in part one from father murr's book a lot of traditionalists, in, at least in my experience, not all, not all of them, uh, there are very balanced traditionalists, I have to say. I could name a couple of them, but I, I won't. I won't. I'll spare them the embarrassment. Um, but um, they, I have found that a lot of them depend upon private revelation in order to justify what's going on within them. Uh, yeah. And they have kind of latched on to Fatima because there is something very sensate. It has, a, it has that that natural hype um, with respect to the third part of the secret, it existed prior to the council, um, in the you know, 40s and the 50s, going into the 60s. Um, but a lot of it comes from the Abbe de Nantes, Abbe Georges de Nantes, and his organization, Le Contre de Reforme Catholique. And I talk about this in my book, um, but I can tell you that the Abbe de Nantes, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to say it, he was running a cult. Mm. The French bishops have publicly stated that there are problematic aspects of his theology, and they refer to Le Contre Reform Catholique as a cult. These are not my words. These are the French bishops. And I've met some of them in Fatima. Um, I, I remember. Can I tell a personal story? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember when that in J September of 2016, when I was at the Mariolog the Roman Mariological Congress held in Fatima that year, I was with um, Dr. Robert Fristigi and the Mariological Society of America. 
um, like Gloria Dodd, Dr. Patricia Sullivan, very good people. And <laughs> one of uh, the one of the Abbe Denant's followers was there in Fatima, Frère Francois de Marie des Anges, and he's one of the well, he's one of the big writers for them. Um, and oh my goodness, oh that guy just I mean, I, I witnessed. I, it was completely clear to me why the French bishops call these people a cult. Um, I saw them, the, 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 the guy was trying to talk and he was getting misdirected by, by people because everybody knew who he was and he was getting misdirected and it was deliberate. Um, and at one point, Padre Salvatore Parella, who was on the Ruini Commission for Medjugorje, he was giving a talk and I just, I missed it. I just missed it because I had to get back home early. <laughs> and he actually, uh, Frère Francois was at the whole conference, and I, this I did see, but not this one time. He was busy, furiously, like writing down, and barely had his head up. He was writing things down, and um, Father Perella got upset and looked at him and said to him in Italian words to the effect of, "If you would, if you would shut up and." pay attention and stop writing, you might actually learn something. And I was like, uh, the person that told me, I was like, did he really say that out loud in a room full of people? And he's like, yes, he did. I'm like, <laughs> I would have loved to have seen that. And I myself engaged in conversation uh, in my broken French, spoken French. I read it better than I speak it. Uh, we were able to communicate briefly in, in French. And um, yeah, it just... They want vindication. Mm. That's that's what I think a lot of it is. And they look to Fatima. In 2017, I was debating Christopher Ferrara at the Angelus Press Conference. And I sat at one of the head tables with one of the four bishops consecrated by Lefebvre. Um, not Williamson. Um, de Mallory, I think it was. Bishop de Mallory. And... I remember we got the, the, the conversation turned to Fatima, and I remember he was he his his words were and this was an exclusive by the way I've never revealed this publicly. He said he said there has to be something out there. She had to, meaning Our Lady. She had to say something else, and I'm like, did you not pay attention to a word I just said for the hour that I just went tit for tat with Ferrara here? You know, she did say something. There was something else. You know. Um, but you know, a lot of the, a lot of the traditionalists, they've witnessed some terrible things, you guys, they really have, they have seen the church turned upwards and sideways. They have seen much apostasy and I'm not without sympathy. I may be, you know, I may hammer Marshall on his faux pas in Fatima or Bella Dodd and other areas. But there are some legitimate problems here. I don't think how people, some people have discussed it has been the most conducive to dialogue. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm very sympathetic. I really am. I myself have seen some horrendous liturgical abuses. And, you know, I, I feel, I really do. I do feel for people. And I understand why they turn to private revelations. Uh, individual claims it is because it, it it almost like heaven is vindicating us heaven is speaking for us it is defending we we have to protect this message because this is all we have in the midst of this terrible darkness you know i totally get it i understand the narrative um and and how people why people think that way so i encourage i encourage people you know yes Hit hard on the facts, especially the macro facts. Um, but you know, let's let's also be temper this with a certain pastoral approach. You know, like I was a seminarian for a diocese here in this country and the United States. And if there's one thing that, that we're taught is you know you have to learn how to work with people. So yes, I hammer people well, I, well on things that need to be hammered. But you know, I I, I have to temper that. I also because I'm, I'm mindful of it. And I don't want to get on a soapbox here, so I'll step down. <laughs> you you had mentioned there earlier <clears throat> that John the Twenty Third did not say, uh, "This is not for our time." 
Where does that come from? That was an apocryphal source. Um, that it, it, it is, it is attributed, you know, I'm not even sure to be honest. All I know is that he didn't say it. Capovilla never claimed it. Nobody else ever did. It was all some rumor. Um, I, I, I admittedly, I didn't track down the source of that rumor, mm -hmm. but I know enough to know uh, that John the 23rd did not say it. Capovilla never said it, never claimed, never put those words in John the 23rd's mouth. The closest that he came to it was, he said, we leave this for others to decide. Yeah, I just assumed it was a, a slanted paraphrase. I, I, I doubt, you know, I didn't think it was a quote at all. Yeah. I get the impression that some of the stuff in, in some of these circles is uh, speculation built on rumors, built on more speculation, built on more speculation, leading to assumptions and the yeah. conclusions. <laughs> and so, and again, as I said in the last episode, it yeah, ancient me, alien it kind of reminds me of the ancient aliens guy that, you know, the, everything is based on speculation, built on more speculation, built on more speculation to come to some wild, absurd conclusion. Um, and, and that's just somewhat of the impression that I get with some of this in some circles. Okay. So let's cover I want to go ahead and cover him on the liturgy because the memes he's got going on in the liturgy section are the memes that we've been dealing with for 40 years. So um, uh, first stop over in Bonini. We don't need to dwell on Bonini too long because we've dwelled on him three or four times now. Uh, I'm going to accept Kevin's claim that he's got a what would it be it would be a first tier witness on the documents you said and then a second tier witness on the events right so you've got a guy that's witnessed the documents showing that he's supposed to be a mason and then he also has secondhand uh witnessed what's going on confirming that it happened that's that's what i got from you kevin uh, I'm sorry, I got a little caught up in the chat room. The specific claim is who, what, about Bunini and what? Well, I'm trying to figure out what what hand witness you have. So you've got first. So your witness, what was it? Uh, you said Father who? Father Charles Murr, uh, okay. author of uh, author of the Godmother. Okay, so Father Murr, you said, is a first hand witness of documents saying that Bunini is Mason. Yes. He saw them himself. Uh, no, I didn't say first-hand witness of documents. He what's was, he the first-hand witness of? He is the he was he you know, he is I guess he is the the first he was the the private secretary to then bishop later cardinal Edward Gagnon who was mm -hmm. the apostolic visitator to the Roman Curia ordered by Pope Paul the sixth in the mid seventies. Father Murr was involved in driving Gagnon around and helping him, assisting him with the documents as part of the apostolic visitation. Okay. Uh, and uh, Father Murr's mentor at the Vatican was Monsignore Mario Marini. Marini was in the room when Bonini's fate was decided because he was discovered to be a Freemason. And Marini and others talked to Father Murr about what had happened. Okay, so he's like, He's like the apostle Luke here. So he's um he's uh he's got he he he's he's talked to all the first hand witnesses directly. And, well, he knew them personally, yes. Okay, and he talked to them about this matter. And they talked to him, yes. Okay, okay. That's I just want to get clear on the level of evidence we have on it. Yeah. Okay. So we don't have like the actual personnel files that were brought by Cardinal Staffa to Pope Paul the Sixth, uh, but Father Murr who was there, worked with Gagnon on the documents, which were part of the, of this stuff with investigating Boone, like the, the bad people in the Curia. He has come out and said, yes, it, it is true. Gagnon, but Benelli, um, Cardinal Benelli, that, that is, Marini and, and others, they all knew about it and they talked to me about it and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so for all intents and purposes, I'm gonna accept that it's the case that um, Bugnini uh, was a, a registered Freemason. So that's how I'm going to operate. Um, uh, is, I, have, I did ask Father Murr to clarify. I said, are you saying, Father Murr, that he was working with or that he was a Freemason? And Father Murr directly clarified to me. He said, no, he was a Freemason. Yeah. So, oh, somebody says, uh, so you're talking about uh, Yeast Chiron's new biography. Um, so 
uh, Eve Sharon. Eve Sharon, I apologize. And uh, he, yeah, uh, Kevin says that he doesn't have this evidence and that it, it needs to be revised. So it would be a dispute between the two. But yes, I've read Bunini, Reformer of the Liturgy. Uh, by, and uh, Bunini, Bunini denies it. He denies it um, in numerous places. He denies it in his own account of the reforms. So, uh, I mean, there is some he said, she said, uh, uh, and one day we, we would need to know more. Um, uh, I don't know when the record's open on this, probably in a long time. Um, um, we don't know if they ever would be. Possibly uh, never. <laughs> because but, of how serious this is. But but in any case, let's, let's, I, I can work with the assumption either way. So let's go ahead and assume he's a, a, a Mason. So um, if he's a Mason, we got a lot. We, so we got a lot of issues. It's not sufficient to show that he's a Mason. Um, first of all, I need to know what lodge he's in because that's going to have impact on what? That's going to have impact on uh, whatever plot he might be involved in, if any. For instance, um, and if you want, and I've recommended John Dickey's *The Craft* over and over again because, for a secular historian, John Dickey knows a lot about Italy and Italian Freemasonry. If, for instance, and we don't know this, and I'm not saying he is, but Mason, but Marshall acts like this is the important lodge. If he was a member of the P2 Lodge and he joins in 1963, like Marshall says, then the P2 Lodge was barely active at all during the 60s. Um, it was reforming during the 60s and doesn't really get going into its famous scandals and problems in the 70s um, until about 1971, after all the reforms. So it doesn't make a lot of sense that it be directing... Um, Bunini to any liturgical mission whatsoever anyway, because that's not what they were doing at that time. Secondarily, um, uh, uh, the P2 Lodge was notoriously right-wing and run by a former fascist. Uh, and so uh, the quick and easy uh, back and forth that Marshall makes with um, uh, Bunini and communism uh, ain't going to work. Um it's also, we have to ask whether or not it would be plausible, whatever things the Freemasons are interested in at the time, whether or not it would be plausible that they would direct a reform of the liturgy, specifically the reform we got. And there's nothing I understand about Freemasonry either in its rights or in its thinking that would result in anything like the reform of the liturgy we got or anything like what Bunini says he's working on in his own documents about the reform or anything I read about uh, the people working on the reform. Like you have to understand Bunini might have been head of a committee, but um, and he protests in his own reform, for instance, that these these um, the, the things that he produced were, so for instance, went to the uh, CDF. I remember one time exasperated, he talks about the Ottaviani intervention and he talks about Ottaviani complaining about some of the Eucharistic prayers. And he says, Ottaviani as head of the CDF approved each one of those prayers. So how can you come around and have the report and then complain about the prayers that you approved? Um, but, but that's not to talk too critically about the Ottaviani report. That's to say, um, if that's the structure, and it is from all accounts, that means that he's not in charge of it. It's a collective effort of a committee that he's the head of that circulated around the whole of the Vatican, including the Holy Father, the CDF, and other important dicasteries. Um, so it's not quite right. Like it, sometimes when traditionalists, and you, you, could, you could read Bunini reformer of the liturgy. Read, I've got in the, um, I mean, there's plenty of books on the reform process and I've got some of them in the bibliography. And if you want to talk to me about more, you can read them. I don't care, just, but read them. And the pick, the trads would make you think that it's Bunini in a closet uh, just the pen in the missile with his, with a snidely whip slash mustache. And then he comes out and the Pope doesn't even look at it and signs it. And here we have, that's not how anything worked. All of this stuff was passed around the entire Korea. It was approved. Maybe it was in a bad reform. Uh, we could talk about that, but it was looked at by everybody. There's no sense in which Bunini has exclusive possession over it. Whatever Tread say, whatever Marshall presents, and whatever uh, Lefebvre sometimes pretends to say. So it's just a there's a false picture going around of Bunini's involvement. I think those are very, very good points, and and I do want to also briefly interject. Um, <clears throat> look, 
I'm not defending Bunini at all. If he was a Freemason, that that's horrible, and I definitely don't want anybody who is a Freemason or uh, anything of the sort uh, involved in, in any form of the liturgy or anything else for that matter. That being said, uh, he wouldn't be the first problematic person involved in documents of ecumenical councils, church documents, papal documents, reforms in the church, whatever. We've had some pretty interesting figures involved in some of the reforms and teachings and councils of, <clears throat> of councils and churches. And so it, uh, look, it, it, that's a fact. And that goes back to the first millennium. And so we're, we all have to deal with that issue. I mean, um, if you want to see something, go look at Erasmus. He's sitting around in big figure and gets promoted to high levels. His views are, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but uh, so I want to talk about, so um, Marshall has under the heading of the disfiguration of the liturgy. He claims that the liturgy, uh, so this is, and I'm going to back up a second. The way he, when he, when he goes into his non-sociological, when he goes into his philosophical talk about Freemasonry, he basically equates Freemasonry with naturalism. Okay, fine. So the view that you know, there's only basically natural things uh, that, you know, this temporal world is all there is, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, and then whenever he tries to link stuff together and he can't do it by way of his real historical evidence, he'll do it by way of ideas. And so he claims that um, the liturgy was made secular, not supernatural. It's a big claim he starts on. How? How does that make any sense? No, it isn't. Here, let's just pick up. Let's just open the missile. Let's just open the missile. Uh, I don't know. Um, what do we, first of all, the whole thing's a prayer to God. I don't know any naturalist way to pray to God. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know. Uh, what's the greeting? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You know, as a naturalist would open a, uh, a meeting. Uh, I don't know. Uh, whatever you might think of the character of the new liturgy, uh, there's no way I, I'm not going to give you that. It's a naturalist uh, thing. It just, it doesn't make sense. That's just a lie. I don't, you can't read it that way. Um, he, uh, he talks about this, uh, he, he leading into this, he goes into the reformation of the Holy week. Now I want to tell you my baptism. I, I've celebrated pre 55 Holy week, the full thing. And not just the full thing as they practiced it in 1959, where you get up at noon. No, no, no. No, no, no. I celebrate the full thing with some of the reforms in mind. So guess what? We start <laughs> we start with Tenebrae um, at like darkness, at like at like nine, eight or nine, and we go until six in the morning, okay? If you these things are huge. My baptism took uh, nine hours. Uh, under the pre-55 liturgy. So this is the, this is the, the, the and it's, it's a great right. Uh, I, I don't I deny that, but uh, it's not, um, you know, it's not small potatoes, uh, you know, and when he talks about the reasons things were formed, if you've actually experienced the liturgy, you could see why people might've reformed some things. So he talks about the revision of what we're called now the pre-55 Holy Week as communist, is where he said this doesn't make sense. I mean, that's the chapter. Of, the title is the the title of the chapter is. Let me get it. It's 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 so goofy to me. It's um the chapter where he goes over this is communist infiltration of the liturgy. Even if Budini is a Freemason, there's no way he's a communist. And uh, on top of that, I, I the the reforms to Holy Week. What do you mean communist? What do you what do you mean? Did were they? Do they induce the workers to seize the means of production? What do you mean? So um, uh, what else? So he, he talks about this as a, as, a, as a communist infiltration. He talks about it as a Freemasonic infiltration, a naturalist infiltration. Look, I've been to these rites. They're very long. It's more plausibly a literal abbreviation to allow for greater lay participation. Um, why? Because, I mean, again, my baptism was eight hours long and most of my guests left. It takes a, so long to do the full rite as it's prescribed that you would cut what you could cut out just to keep a parish there. 
And, um, you know, if the rubrics weren't shortened in some way, it'd be very hard if you thought that everybody should be participating um, psychologically, prayerfully in the whole aspect. I mean, it's very hard for me to go all, through all 12 readings and focus on what's being said. Um, if you don't have the hand missile, you tried to listen. That's also very hard. And it's all in Latin, of course. Uh, I'm not, you know, dr uh, dropping on that. But every part of that liturgy is very long. And and it, it's, the, it's very hard for the laity. It's very hard for the clergy. It's a marathon. And so it's 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 obvious why you might want to knock it down, um, you know, whether or not that's a good idea. He also says somehow it's Protestant. First of all, I don't understand how something can be naturalist, communist and Protestant all at once. The Protestants clearly aren't naturalists, generally, and for the most part. Um, but uh, Protestants don't even have elaborate Holy Week ceremonies in the same way we, we do, except maybe some strange Anglican things. And so it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't, the Holy Week revision doesn't look like anything Protestants do. Um, after he describes this revision uh, in that chapter, he, he makes this august proclamation, and it's hilarious to me. He says, the modus operandi of Bunini and company was to propose changes as an experiment and then press for the changes to be required, end quote. Um, that's called revision. That's how you revise things. That's how any revision go. This is not a conspiratorial. Claim. If I want to change things at work, I go, hey, boss, why don't we change it around a little bit, see how it goes. And then if it goes good, I go, OK, let's let's do it. Let's keep it that way. That's how you that's how you change stuff. <laughs> that's not you didn't make a, this is a big conspiratorial discovery. That's just how revision works. Um, he spins after this, he spins a bizarre aside at the beginning of chapter 20, attempting to discredit the notion of active participation in Pius X. First, so Pius, the, when the first time uh, active participation uh, is talked about, it's talked about in an allocution of Pius X, if I recall. And in the Italian version, the phrase active participation in Italian, I don't know. The, the phrase Italian uh, uh, active participation is used, but in the Latin, it's, it's not, or it's cut, or it's abbreviated. And you'll see that um, in, when the popes gave allocutions back in the day, and even now to a certain extent, when they would give them in vernacular and then they would move them into the official Latin, stuff would be cut out for whatever reason. I, I don't know. I, 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 uh, my Latin is not that great, but I suspect that it's probably very difficult to say active participation in Latin. But in any case... He spends a long time trying to discredit it because, uh, on the basis of this linguistic difference. But so, like, that doesn't, what does that do? Like, okay, just because it's in the Italian and not the Latin, does it mean that it can't be a source for subsequent liturgical thought and development? And it's certainly in subsequent magisterium in that exact phrase. So this is not, so what? So what? It doesn't discredit it at all. Um, and on top of that, uh, so it just it's an odd rabbit trail, but on top of that, he thinks that the directive to change liturgical rites so as to increase active participation conflates the baptismal priesthood and the sacerdotal priesthood. How? How how does that make any sense? If if so, you're telling me that if we the laity can better understand and unite ourselves with liturgical action with a priest now? That doesn't make any sense. That's not anything anybody's saying. There might be, I don't deny that you might be able to find some modernist liturgist or some subsequent thinker that thinks that way, sure, but that doesn't mean that's the magist that's the idea of the magisterium and from everything you can read in any official source it, it just isn't so I, I it's just contrary to everything anybody's trying to do um taylor says the principles of the reform directed in sacrosanctum concilium are thus he says of it the the liturgy is reduced to utility since the rites will henceforth be changed, quote, and this is from Sacrosanctum, as may seem useful or necessary. 
Um, okay. Well, yeah, any revision is going to be as may seem useful or necessary. So what? Like, uh, I mean, and first of all, this is a, this quote is, this, this paraphrase is decontextualized. It's an oversimplification of the principle of sacrosanctum concilium because most people don't understand this because most people don't bother to read. But I mean, I, I, I go read Fortescue or go read Jungman's two volume uh, work on the development of the liturgy of the liturgy. Since we began the reform of the liturgy movement in the mid 19th century, a lot of work had been done on the development of the liturgy, and it became obvious to people the exact nature of the various additions that had been um, uh, uh, added in the Roman Rite, their origin, uh, what wasn't there in the beginning, what was the the purpose and the relevance of the various parts in their original edition, et cetera, et cetera. So when Sacrosanctum Concilium speaks of the revision of these rites and the removal of procrust, of, procrust, of, of, of uh, additions, of uh, things that have gotten amended on that don't really have any relevance now, it has this background of uh, about a hundred years of work uh, on uh uh, liturgical reform and liturgical envelop development in mind, which you have to keep in mind. But on top of that, um, it doesn't even seem to really be a critique because, you know, take, for example, the many changes in the Roman rite over time, such as the reservation of communion to one kind. Why was communion reserved to one kind? Uh, because there was a risk of profanation, etc. right? Well, is this not some change that seemed, quote, useful and necessary? Surely most useful, surely most liturgical changes were seen as useful and, and necessary, as opposed to what? Like liturgical changes seen as useless and unnecessary, liturgical changes conducted by accident. I mean, what what is Taylor's model of liturgical development? Does he think that liturgical changes are simply revealed to us from heaven and we obey them and we don't understand their purpose, even on the part of those who did the revision. Surely he doesn't think that the TLM was revealed to us from the apostles or some such thing. So then, well, remember, go ahead. Do you know actually one of the last acts of Pius XII's pontificate was a document that specifies what the exact nature of active participation means. I, I know he had documents on it. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, just Googled like, it. It was literally like the last gasp of his pontificate. Yeah, as he died, this document was supposed to be promulgated. And it was, in fact, promulgated. I, I, I've seen it. I think it's in the Acta, um, I, and, or at least the Servitore Romano, or some. I, I've seen it in print. Um, I, 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 would, I would like to, personally, I would like to have seen Marshall mention that because he defines active participation in accordance with how he understands it and says nothing about how Pius XII meant it, you know? Um, I, we, we do have some chat questions here. I want to get to those and then wrap it up a little bit. Um, if y'all, if y'all feel that y'all have plenty of more information, just let me know. We can always come back and, and do a, a third part here. That wouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, but I do want to get to some of these. So let, let's go ahead and dive into those. Okay. Uh, unless you had a final comment that, that you needed to make to wrap it up. Um, I mean, I guess the only thing I wanted to talk about really briefly, and I won't go through the whole thing, but um, this is where, this is the part in the text where he evokes Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi, mm -hmm. uh, which he says is the law of prayer is the law of belief. And then he says, if you change the liturgy and the prayers, you'll necessarily change the faith. Now, I would recommend that everybody go, when you're in your free time, go to Pius XII's Mediator Day. In Mediator Day, 46, 47, and 48, Pius XII discusses this saying, and he says, no, <laughs> that's not how the liturgy works. So strictly speaking, the liturgy is to be understood in terms of the magisterium, and it's not this free-floating thing that makes the faith whatever you might want it to be, because in fact, modernists had made that argument. What did modernists say? Modernists thought that, because remember, as we talked about when we did the show on it, modernists think that religious experience 
is important. And so they think, well, the liturgy is the place where you experience stuff. And so if something happens in the liturgy and it works and it causes a spiritual experience, well, that overrides anything the church teaches. That's how we know what the faith is. No, <laughs> no. If the church says the liturgy is this, if the church says the liturgy means this, that's what it means. It doesn't mean what you think it means. And the same thing is the other way around. If you go, if the church revises the liturgy and you have a certain experience of it and you think it means that now we don't have a sacrifice or whatever they say it means. And the church goes, no, it's a sacrifice. That's what he's doing. Uh, and that's what the prayers that we have in there mean. Uh, you to, you're wrong. That's the point. Uh, it's, it's, um, it, it doesn't work like that. Uh, and so the idea that you could revise the liturgy and then contrary to what the church teaches about the liturgy, conclude that it's not a sacrifice anymore, that the priesthood is abrogated, that will be whatever you want. That's not what we teach about lex orandi, lex credendi. In fact, Pius suggests a, a revised saying, if, if that's how you're going to, uh, you're going to take it. Um, he, he suggests lex credendi legem statuit supplicande, let the rule of belief determine the rule of prayer. Um, so it's not, it didn't quite work out like you want it to work out. Yeah, My, some nuance there. And I don't see the, I, I, I read that journal. There's not, there's not enough nuance there. And that, that was kind of an issue I had. My thing is, I think this criticism of the liturgy that we hear in some traditional circles is short sighted. Uh, t take that to its next conclusion. Take it, take it to its next step, I should say. Go before uh, Vatican II. Go before all of these, you know, post-conciliar reforms of the liturgy, and and let's apply that same logic to some of the liturgical changes that go back about a thousand years ago. And, and let's make those same criticisms about some of the developments and changes that we've made in the Latin Rite for about a thousand years. And let's apply those criticisms that we make to the liturgical reform, also to the liturgical reforms that we see at the beginning of the second millennium in the Western Rite. And, and that's why it's hard to have these kinds of criticisms against the post-conciliar reforms in a conversation with the Orthodox, because they're just going to be thinking, wait, you're accusing the post-conciliar church of liturgical novelty. And you're pointing us back to the traditional Latin mass of, you know, Trent. Did I get that right? Yeah, you got that right. Okay, well, do you realize there's quite a few liturgical novelties with what we see there with Trent <laughs> as well? So we just need to apply that to the preconciliar era and be a little bit more consistent. The Orthodox are going to point that out and note that, that in some ways we have had a problem with liturgical novelty for a very long time, going back way before the post-conciliar reforms. We've had a problem with liturgical novelty for a very long time, for especially for nearly a thousand years. That doesn't mean some of those liturgical novelties weren't necessary. It doesn't mean that they are evil. It just means that they are liturgical novelties, and we need to recognize that. All right. Well, I want to get to some of these chat questions here. Philosophy in the desert. How would you summarize Marshall's view of the Novus Ordo, and why is he wrong? River, starting with you, and then Kevin. Um, so he's actually pretty thin on the... Uh, on the Novus Ordo, he does strongly suggest that it's infiltrated. Uh, by this, he means uh, he seems to uh, light-handedly and without a lot of criticism accept the Ottaviani uh, interventions assessment, um, which is wrong. Uh, and uh, he has no he he seems to not take seriously at all any of the subsequent magisterium on the liturgy at all about what's going on, and he just seems to think it's a naturalized, secularized uh, liturgy, and this makes no sense. It makes no sense if you look at the liturgy. It makes no sense if you look at the magisterium around the liturgy. It certainly makes no sense if you look at the magisterium subsequent to the liturgy. So I, I don't know what to say about his view. It just doesn't work. Kevin, did you have any comments there about his view of the liturgy? 
Um, yeah, I think that it's problematic, um, at least with respect to how he discusses the liturgical reforms itself. He's got a bad picture of how it all went down. He paints Bonini as the as the um, like the, the the boogeyman or the, the whipping boy. He puts it everything at Bonini's feet, even now. Even now, he still tweets about it. He says, oh, yeah, I attended the pre-Bunini Holy Week rites of 1955, and I'm good, I'm holy, I'm a saint, whatever, you know. And I'm just like, this is, this, is, this is insane. You know, the PN reforms were just that, the PN reforms. And, you know, they weren't, Bunini, you know, he had the arrogance, according to Mother Pascalina, to arrogate to himself the, the credit for those for the PN reforms. But Mother Pascalina Leonard, Father, Ma, Father Murr's godmother was absolutely adamant that no, that was very uh, wrong of him to do. It was all pious. He wanted pious to tell the Holy Father. He wanted to have that uh, the, the, the the those reforms. It wasn't Bunini, and so I think that that with with respect to the reforms, Marshall paints a pretty bad picture, and he's giving people wrong ideas, uh, and that's something we have to be careful of. And even his understanding of what exactly Sacrosanctum Concilium did uh, and what it wanted to do. You know, there is some legitimate debate between what the Novus Ordo is and what the Council Fathers wanted. There is some legitimate debate there about did we get what the fathers, Council Fathers wanted. Uh, but to conduct it along the lines that Marshall does, I, I have grave reservations in the scholarly academic sense for that, to pursue it along those lines. The Castman asks this question, since Masons can't be communists, then who were the revolutionary Mexicans and Spanish Republicans that, <clears throat> that persecuted the church in the 20s and 30s? Weren't they leftist Masons? Um, so, again, I'm not denying that le Masons can be leftist. All classical liberals are leftist in some sense, um, but it's a bourgeois movement. Uh, if you don't now... <laughs> This is not well understood by Americans, but socialists are bourgeois socialists are not communists. Uh, you'd have to be, uh, you'd have to, you'd have to understand Marxism well enough to understand the distinction and how these people would have a conflict. Um, so you you might of course see uh, middle class socialism floating around in masonry, uh, and so we and you'd have to look at each each case. But in every case where communism wins the day as a proletarian workers movement, even if it dissolves into the tyranny it always dissolves into, it's always in a fight with Masons because Masons always want, because of how they're designed and because of their constitution, they always want middle and upper class rule and determination and determination by good tradesmen and determination by men of good reputation, good earning and blah, blah, blah. And that's totally opposed to what communists are trying to do. So you'd have to look at it in each case, which doesn't mean you can't have some kind of contingent um, revolutionary union, but I mean, in Italy, it went totally the other way. It was the communists plus the uh, Christian Democrats versus the Freemasons who drove the Freemasons out. Um, the, that's that's what the P two scandals about. If you want to look it up, um, it's it's not unusual to have the lines drawn that way between far right against the Masons and uh, communist left against the Masons. It's not unusual at all. I wouldn't be surprised if there was some alliance somewhere and South America is not my wheelhouse. So if something weird happened in South America, I don't know. But the general trend in Europe doesn't look like what Bunini, sorry, what Marshall talks about at all. And I invite you, don't take, read John Dickey, uh, The Craft, look at it. Read um, the Popes in the European Revolution on all the secret societies. Uh, you can even read, uh, you know, the church's own talk. You can read Catholic Encyclopedia on Freemasonry and the Carbonari. It doesn't look like what Marshall says. It looks different, which is not to say that, um, you know, he doesn't get some things right. But Marshall has a very weird narrative that doesn't look like the history. And there's more to say and there's better detail. And his picture just doesn't. It's stuff that he draws from his picture doesn't follow is what I'm saying. I say from a philosophical perspective, his inferences aren't plausible. If you want to go, well, the details, a little, yeah, okay, the details are a little nuanced. Whatever the nuance is, it's not going to look like what Marshall thinks it is. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Uh, Lewis asks, 
Does infiltration say anything about the Protestants present at Vatican II? If so, what does he say and what is your response? Yeah, we got to it. He holds the old, the Protestants did it uh, view. Um, he doesn't dwell on it too long, but he holds on it. Um, I mean, if you want, uh, we didn't have time to go into it, uh, but you can read Lakotis's the, the Pope's, the, the Pope, the Council on the Mass. Uh, and you can even, I mean, I think it's the Pontifical Council for Rights or whatever have, have definitively stated that the Protestants did not have decisive influence. Yeah, who who was it on, as part of the council that said um, the concilium that said that they actually had no real kind of substantive input? Who, I forget who it was. It's in his biography. He, I don't remember. But here, let me. I mean, let's be real clear. Um, Eastern Orthodox observers were there too. Are we Eastern Orthodox now. And and I'm here referring to the liturgical reforms. And now, if we're just talking about Vatican II broadly, I mean, you you had invitations to bring Eastern Orthodox to Vatican I, of course. And so this was nothing uh, new. In fact, I think some Protestants were in, invited to Trent. If, am I, yeah, yeah, not, they were. Know, please, please correct me on that. But they, they I, were I'm pretty invited. sure that's the case. And uh, so, yeah, the, there there's nothing new there. So uh, I, I I don't know why it's 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 a it's a gross calumny and in fact as can be as can be dim just read the missal, it's not a Protestant document. The general instruction makes it clear it's not a Protestant document, and Protestants make it clear it's not a Protestant document because they don't agree with the doctrines contained and articulated implicitly in the mass. Uh, the Kevin, end. any any final input there, comments on the question of Freemason. Yeah on that question yeah. and anything else because we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here yeah um you know i i think river and i could have a really interesting conversation about mason masons and communists <laughs> uh but admittedly i'd have to do a little bit more homework on that um my understanding is that you know someone it doesn't it, it communism is a bit sneaky they will take it does take advantage of certain things in order to and will revise itself like a chameleon. Uh, Bella Dodd herself talks about that in her book School of Darkness, um, and that's actually one of the reasons why she got out of it or wanted to get out of it was because she realized it wasn't really a workers' movement. Um, somebody in the chat here, in particular, said uh, uh, communism. Communism is never a workers' movement. The leadership is ne are never actual workers. They are elites, masons, people with other agendas. Workers are just the useful tools. In many respects, yes, I, I think that there is some truth to that. And even in Bella Dodd's own story, you know, she was shocked, and that's and that was kind of what kind of sparked her crisis of conscience was to see that contradiction that they really work for the for the working man, the underdog, and that's what she said that she was for. She wanted to help poor people, and once she found out the real face of communism in that regard, she's like, I don't think I can be a part of this. Um, so I, I always kind of, as of right now, I take it back to that the, we're still very close to the historical events. And I think we all have to be very cautious in either direction, you know, and we have to be very careful about, you know, we can be very strong, be very passionate about something. And like one of my professors at Franciscan University who just retired, uh, you know, back yourself up. If you disagree with me, fine, but back yourself up. I have more respect for somebody if they back themselves up. Uh, with facts and you know logic, than just simply well I think that or I believe or I feel no show show me the money you know so I just I just encourage people you know these are still open areas of conversation and there's room for legitimate debate um, but of course you know we have to be very careful with how we with how we discuss them so um, yeah Bunini liturgy Marshall you know I don't agree with how Marshall discusses everything. Um, but at the same time, it's like, there are some legitimate things for discussion and we have to be careful how we, how we hold that discussion. Uh, one last question on here. Was there a real or meaningful infiltration by commies or masons? Is it just mostly sensationalist stories like ancient aliens? Uh, I tend to think that certainly on the, um, on the level of the priesthood, I mean, you certainly probably, I mean, it's obvious in South America that you have radical Marxist leftist priests floating around doing stuff. They were popular. Uh, and that shows up 
in the United States, a little less bad. It shows up anywhere where there's a lot of poor people and you can radicalize them that way. Um, Masonry is a little more complicated. Um, I don't, uh, certainly after the war, I would not be surprised if Masonry was involved or at least willing to ally or at least willing to work with the church because the church was willing to allow an alliance and is still willing to allow an alliance with um, the liberal world order. And I wanted, we were going to talk about that, but we don't have, a, have enough time. But all of, of that all depends on the question of w what the world order is going to be and how we're to deal with it. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if you had some Freemason uh, Catholic alliance, uh, if not direct Masons, because, you know, it's not trivial before 1983 to be found out to be a Mason. You will lose your position. It, it was not a nothing deal. Whereas you could be a communist. All right. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate y'all coming on and doing this. Y'all y'all have put in a lot of research and time into this. I really want to thank y'all. So uh, I, I'd like to do it again. Um, any other shows that y'all want to do, let me know. Maybe some show suggestions and, and we can definitely do it. But once again, thank y'all for coming on. Thank you very much for having us. Maybe if Marshall responds to all this, we can have a follow-up. <laughs> I, yeah. I wouldn't hold my breath. <laughs> But if he doesn't, if y'all have another topic, let me know. I'd be happy to do a, a duo with you guys again. And then, well, I guess it'd be a trio, but y'all know what I mean. Um, and of course, I'll have, yeah. Should we, could, would now be a good time to announce that one thing that we would, that you Yes, would yes. Go ahead and give the date as well. Okay. People have been asking in the chat room. That's one of the reasons why I asked now. Uh, I'm happy to tell everybody that. Uh, Mr. Lofton and I have been engaging in conversation, and Mr. Lofton, at least for the second webinar that I'm giving on Fatima, is graciously hosting it. Um, we're not sure about the other ones just yet, but at least the second one, uh, Reason and Theology, will be hosting it. So more to come on that, and we're looking at June 13th, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that sounds That's right it. to me. Let me double check, though. Okay, um, yes, but tentatively June 13th, uh, so please stay tuned. It's uh, It's... It's already written up. It's loaded. I've got, you know, I'll try to put some pictures yep. to it and everything and make it all loaded for bear. So L looking forward to it. And we'll, we'll talk more off the air about some other show ideas that I have for you as well. And uh, well, I'll be in touch with you too, River, about some ideas for shows that you have, or, you know, also you can throw some out to me. So I'll have you gentlemen both on individually in the future. But if you also want to do one, uh, a joint show, let me know. Uh, we could do that. But again, thank y'all for coming on. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. You too. And everybody, thank y'all for watching and your participation there in the chat. Uh, very interesting stuff. Great questions as well. I really appreciated the interaction. Now, of course, whenever this posts on YouTube, you're welcome to post your comments as well and your questions. Definitely invite those. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Hit the bell for notification of future shows. And also go ahead and like. Hit that like button if you don't mind. And then most importantly, check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. If you would like to support us and get access to extra content. So again, check it out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. And that'll do it till next time. God bless you all. Have a great evening.